Okay. So. Okay, we're going to call the uh, work session order of October 9th, 2019. Um, welcome, everybody, to uh, the first agenda item is the uh, role of uh, food bank community partnerships here in Manatee County. And I will uh, turn it over to Sherry for some introductory, uh, introductory remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and everyone that's here, the board members. Um, back in um, early September, the board asked the administration to put together this work session so they could better understand the circumstances locally about food banks. And so that since there had been a lot of discussion about the topic, we decided to put it in an open forum here. And as you can see, invite a lot of the food banks and the food pantries um, that are in the community and many of them are here today and we hope that you know everyone at the, by the end of the meeting will have an opportunity to just speak about some of their challenges and some of the positive things that are going on but uh, mainly you know we have our local food bank of manatee that had been operating um, under the Meals on Wheels Plus program for quite a number of years. We also have our uh, Feeding um, America affiliate, which is the Feeding Tampa Bay program here as well. And so there's been some recent changes in locally what will be happening. And um, when we first scheduled the work session, uh, it was at a time when things were under discussion. Now some other changes have taken place. I know that Meals on Wheels has been in to speak individually with all the board members as well as feeding Tampa Bay. And so what we thought we'd also do before we have both, both of those organizations talk about their programs and challenges is to, is to bring your partners in the community, some of the stronger uh, people who have a role in our food banks, to just talk a little bit about what they do on their behalf. And so we have both the Manatee Community Foundation and United Way Suncoast here. And I just want to start off by calling up the Manatee Community Foundation, Susie Bowie, and have her speak about their role with food banks. Thank you, Susie. Welcome. Thanks for coming, Susie. Yeah. Thanks so much, Sherry, and thanks to all of you for having this very important meeting. Certainly food is one of the most important concerns of people in Manatee County. With all of the things that donors and citizens care about, from education to self-sufficiency, the thrivability of our community, if our citizens are not getting food, there's hardly anything else that we can do in our community. So we recognize that at Manatee Community Foundation. Just to give you a little bit of background, MCF was formed about 20 years ago by a group of community leaders that understood that we needed a strong community foundation in Manatee County. The way that we work is we have very um, personal and flexible <coughs> relationships with charitable individuals who live throughout Manatee County. And each of them cares about something a little bit different. Some of them care about food security, some of them care about the environment, some of them care about animal welfare. So most of the funds that actually leave Manatee Community Foundation, and we have awarded more than $30 million in grants and scholarships over the last 20 years, um, many of those funds come as a directive from the donors that we work with. So when they come to us, they tell us that food security is an issue for them. We help them with site visits. We help them understand all the different food pantries and food banks that are operating in our area so that they can understand what their choices are for giving and then they make those choices themselves based on what is most important to them. Um, anytime we see a change in food distribution in our community, it's time for all of us to take a deep look. At the end of the day, again, what we care most about is whether or not people in need are receiving food. So having these types of conversations is very helpful so that we can understand the challenges and opportunities and make very informed decisions about our giving and also help to inform the donors that come to us for advice in their giving. So thank you. Thank you, Susie. Um, Brownwin. Hi there. Thank you. And I echo Susie's comments on thank you very much for having this important conversation in our community. Um, my comments center on more level setting. So who are we serving with food in, in Manatee County? I brought some documentation so that you can 
have that for later. I will not go over all of that because the time is short. Um, but as a United Way, um, we believe that everybody deserves equitable access to create the life they imagine for themselves. And the way we do that is by partnering with businesses, nonprofits, government, media, and community uh, to fight for things that no one organization can solve alone. And we fight for education and financial stability. The 2018 United Way Alice Report identified Manatee County's population as 375,888, including 142,465 households. 44% of those households are Alice, asset limited, income constrained, employed, or at the poverty level in Manatee County. In the neighborhoods of our central corridor, the Alice Report identifies 40,805 households where the percentage of Alice in households in poverty rises consider considerably. 48% in our north region, the Palmetto area, 62% in our central region or downtown, and 62% in our southern region or Samoset. According to the Feeding America website, 46,700 Manatee County community members are food insecure. Hardworking families are making choices between food, health, transportation, housing, child, and childcare every day. As we shared with you at the Council of Governments meeting in July, our community is coming together around the big plan, Community United for Our Children's Success. Focusing on 10 schools in our central corridor, where in the 2017-18 school year, 75% of our children did not test as reading on grade level. So as we begin to bring those two things together, fam Alice families who are struggling to make ends meet and are making hard choices, and children who are not thriving in school we require innovative, forward-thinking solutions to ensure that our children and families have the resources they need to feed their families and establish habits of good nutrition now and in the future. Nutrition is vital to grade-level reading success, and we must embrace innovation and work together to create a more hopeful future for Manatee County. Thank you all very much for this important day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, we also want to then now talk a little bit more about the local circumstances of food banks, and we have our uh, two lead programs, Meals on Wheels Plus and Feeding Tampa Bay. And so with that, we'd ask Mary Beth Phillips to come up and talk a little bit about the um, impacts here for the local food bank. Uh, thank you so much, Sherry. If I could just start and say, I want to wish Vanessa a happy birthday today. So, <laughs> happy birthday. Thank you. That's right. <laughs> um, also, in reading the agenda for today that was listed on the website, I think there is some confusion. Um, so I just want to clarify the difference between a food bank and a food pantry. So we are, the Food Bank of Manatee is the only food bank in Manatee County. We have um, service or we service about 99 different pantries and agencies. And if I could just take also a minute to thank so many of our friends who have come here today to speak up and, and share their thoughts. Um, our commitment um, at Meals Out Meals Plus to operate the Food Bank of Manatee for the last 34 years has not wavered. Our mission and efforts to provide nutrition in our community to the people in need is proven in our relationships and in our results. But maintaining the food supply with the two contracts now being managed out of Tampa is definitely a challenge for us um, to serve our local pantries. So we are very concerned and our concern actually comes from the pantries, and I think you're going to hear from some of them. So today's discussion really should be coming from the pantries and how they're going to receive the food from these two huge contracts. For us in Manatee, that's 3 million pounds of food that's going through Tampa. So that's our concern. So with that, I'd like to introduce Mammy Forstall, who wants to say a few words. Thanks, Mammy. And thank you again um, for having this discussion. It's 
It's really critical. I am Bambi Forrestal, the board chair. I've been on the board for 11 years. Um, thank you, Vanessa, for everything that you've done for the organization. Thank you to the commissioners that have taken time out of their busy schedule to hear from your constituent pantries um, and listen to their concerns. Um, I want to reiterate what Mary Beth has said. Uh, these pantries are the heart and soul, the feet, the hands, and the legs of what we do to provide the food to Manatee County. Most are volunteers, if not all are volunteers. They're using their own vehicles, their own gas. Um, they're working with very limited resources, very limited labor support. Um, it's a difficult job that they have, and it was made easier by being able to come to our food bank, pick out just what they needed for their needs, whether it was a weekly or a daily service that they provided. <coughs> that is something that is no longer available to them. Um, so a huge thank you and recognition to those uh, pantries. Um, I'd like to give you some, some facts that I'd like you to remember. Uh, Meals on Wheels has operated the only food bank in Manatee County for 34 years. Uh, we also provide home delivered meals to um, seniors and others that can't cook and provide for themselves for 47 years. So we have been a community partner for 47 years. The people that volunteer for us, the people that are serving on our board, and most of our employees live and work in Manatee County. We are providing to our community, to our neighbors. This isn't a job to us, it's a calling. 94.5% um, of all of the dollars that we collect go directly to our services that we provide. In 2017, at our peak before we lost the contracts, we provided 4.6 million pounds of food in Manatee County. In 2018, even after we lost the contract with Feed America Tampa Bay in June of last year, we still were able to provide 4.1 million pounds of food. Yes. That was because the additional USDA contract that stepped up. We served over 105 pantries in, in Manatee County. And finally, and most importantly, 100% of the food, 100% of the food that we picked up stayed in Manatee County. Whether we picked it up from Tampa and brought it here, sometimes we had opportunities to get it from other counties, but 100% of what we delivered and what we distributed was for Manatee County residents. Think about that. To those of you who have been told that our model for food banking is outdated, or perhaps we could have done something differently, I challenge you to consider those facts, and you will be hearing even more from the agencies and pantries. We are at a point now where nothing Meals on Wheels can do or say is going to change the outcome but there is still more that you can do and say. Um, this is out of our control. Um, as we move forward, you will deal with the fallout from this new model. I hope you will remember my words. This is a very bad deal for Manatee County. And specifically to those people who need it most. You've heard from Susie, you've heard from Bronwyn. Those are facts. I didn't make them up. Those are facts. This isn't about what's best for Manatee County. This isn't about providing more food to Manatee County. This is about smoke and mirrors because the food from Manatee County and the money is not staying in Manatee County. If this was about being more efficient, if this was about getting better at what we do, if there was a way to bring food from out of the area more efficiently than we do it, trust me, Mary Beth and I would be all about promoting it to you. Think about what's happening right in front of you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, so Mr. Chairman, um, we also um, want to ask to come up the Feeding Tampa Bay um, President and CEO Thomas Mance to talk about the Feeding Tampa Bay program. I know that um, they've been to brief all of you and to talk to many of the pantries that are in the on audience. And yes, 
Um, you will get an opportunity to hear from folks that are here in the audience, and we hope that anything that they provide will just help to enhance future service. So thank you. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to address uh, the commission. We appreciate the a chance to have a conversation. We recognize there's clearly a lot of emotion in the room and a lot of concern in the room. We want to make sure that we acknowledge that and understand that. So let me again level set a little bit for our organization. So Feeding Tampa Bay is a part of the Feeding America network. There are 200 food banks across the United States that do what we do. Each of us have a territory that we're responsible for. Sometimes that's as large as a state and sometimes it's as small as a uh, city or a community area. We're responsible for 10 counties, uh, which is about 9,000 square miles. There are about 4.2 million people in that population base. In that population base or in that county, uh, responsibility is also Manatee County. So in our world, uh, we've always had responsibility for Manatee County. We did that through a contract with uh, Food Bank of Manatee until, as mentioned, a few years ago. The role of a food bank like ours in any community is the collection and redistribution of food and other resources. Right, so our goal ultimately is to locate as much food as we can and then figure out ways to get it into the system as effectively as we can do that. Right? So our goal and role has always been to do that. So uh, whether it's been through food sourced out of a grocery store, whether it's been for food sourced from a farmer, whether it's been USDA food, all of that, uh, our propriety, our responsibility is to make sure that we collect it and move it into our 10 counties. Right. We also have a wide variety of different resources available to us beyond the retail uh, sector and beyond USDA. We work with manufacturers and other donors across our 10 counties and across the United States that help us locate food. And again, we move that into all of our counties. Right. So for us, that's largely our responsibility. We do have a secondary responsibility, which we think is important also. It's not only making sure that we feed people, but it's also providing other services and opportunities to help folks engage uh, in what we would call ending the line solutions. So how do you get someone out of a food line? So it's both parts of those things we feel responsible for. As an organization, we want two outcomes, health, which comes from access to food, and secondarily, we want capability, which comes from access to benefits, services, and other things of that nature. So that's really what we do as an organization. We work across our 10 counties with about 550 different agencies. So depending on the county, there are any number of folks that want to work with us. There are other independent partners or independent folks in all the counties we service that may or may not have a relationship with us but also provide food in their local communities. This is not unfamiliar to us. So for us to operate here in Manatee County and have Food Bank of Manatee here alongside is not necessarily unusual or different to us. Uh, because we're no longer contractually connected, it doesn't necessarily mean that both of us can't provide resource to the community. We're comfortable that that can continue to occur. So I want to make sure I also address a couple of the very specific things that were brought up uh, because we were asked by many of you commissioners about this, and I want to make sure that I address this. First, USDA food is required by contract to stay in Manatee County. Not one bit of it can go anywhere else. And irrespective of who the distributor of that food is, we are required by law from the federal all the way down to the state level to make sure it is delivered in Manatee County. That is an obligation that none of us here in this room can change. So we understand the concern about distribution methodology and models, but what I want the commissioners to understand is all of that food will stay here. I would also make this point about USDA food because it's important to all of us. We have had a surplus of USDA food for the last two years, really the last year. And the reason for that surplus is two reasons. One is hurricane relief. And number two is trade mitigation. We're going to continue after those run out, which will happen in the next six to nine months, we're going to continue to see USDA food decrease. So while there were as much as I think you said 4 million pounds last year, that's going to continue to decrease over time. There's been a long trend line that suggests it's continuing to go away, right? The second thing is retail food and the other contract that was mentioned previously. Feeding America owns the contracts to all of the grocery store relationships throughout the United States. We don't own those because most of the grocery stores you're familiar with have multi-county or multi-state, excuse me, responsibilities. And Feeding America awards that contract to us. When we severed our relationship with Food Bank of Manatee, we became responsible for all of those stores. So all the stores that are here, all the retail organizations that have a relationship with Feeding America, we are under contract to collect and redistribute that. 
Again, all of that food stays here in Manatee County, contrary to the conversations that have been had. There are instances on occasion where we've had to bring stuff back up to Tampa, but most of our model works as pick it up local and keep it local. We do this across all of our 10 counties. This is not unique to Manatee County. For us as an organization, it would be incredibly inefficient and expensive for us to bring food back to uh, Tampa and keep it in Tampa because the reverse is actually true, and I'll explain that in a moment. So again, on occasion, do we have a truck that goes north with food in it? We do, but then it comes back south the next day with the same food in it. Our goal is to keep all food local across all of our 10 counties. I can't stress to you enough that this is not unusual for us. This is what we do, whether it's in Highlands or Hardy or any other county that we support, citrus food stays local. That makes sense to us, and it's also the most efficient and the most effective way to do that. And so the food that we've recovered out of grocery stores has stayed here. Right? And so as we have gone through that process, we're very aware that some agencies did or did not want to come along with us, and we've made our way through that process as effectively as we can. We remain hopeful that there will be a growth in those relationships as time moves on. But again, our goal is to bring food into Manatee County. Again, I would also tell the commissioners that food out of the retail segment will continue to reduce also. It has gone down year over year and will continue to do that. And the reason why that will happen is all the stores are getting much more efficient and better at maintaining their inventory. Mm -mm. So what does that ultimately mean? Last year, uh, between last year when we took over the contract and uh, after our first year, we have brought in a million plus pounds from other parts of our community and other parts of the United States, not here in Manatee. Part of what we do for you and with you is we will provide sources and resources from other parts of our service territory. One of the nice things about having a partner that is large and capable is the ability to bring in other resources and programs into the community that aren't available here. And we'll continue to increase the amount of food that we bring here as those other resources um, uh, decline. If you look at it from a pounds basis, Manatee County, based on the latest study, needs about 18 million pounds, almost 19 million pounds of food every single year in order to feed the citizenry of Manatee County who are food insecure. Last year, based on what we did, and we don't know what Food Bank of Manatee was able to do, but last year probably combined, if we were lucky, we provided around 8 million pounds of food. There's plenty of room to grow and plenty to do. We're very aware that there is a significant gap of some 10 to 11 million pounds every year. Our objective? is to make sure that we try and answer that by developing resources, programs, and other opportunities to feed folks here in Manatee County. We're committed to that. We've been committed to that. We've been committed to the community, and we're committed to doing that. So for us, our responsibility remains the same, which is to show up, work hard, try and make sure we're feeding people. I want to acknowledge that change has been difficult for the agencies here and the community here. Our focus as an organization is to work alongside, I think as you described, these great partners, and we hope that that continues. But our focus is on the individual who needs the service. How and where do we get to them best? What's the best methodology in place for us to do that? We have developed solutions and processes and programs across our other counties that we're bringing in here. Right, so we started after-school meal programs with Boys and Girls Clubs. We're talking to your school system about pantries inside of schools. We have to go to a different place and find ways to connect with people. That's not at the expense of the agencies we have currently. It's alongside. The gap is 11 million pounds of food a year. We're all going to have to find different ways to get food into the community. Not either one of us, but both of us. We're going to have to figure this out. Our commitment is to make sure that that happens. So I would end by saying we're happy to be here. Uh, we're happy to have part of the conversation with you. We understand, again, that this is an emotionally difficult subject. Uh, but uh, our commitment is no different than anybody else in this room. We would not presume anyone else's commitment, and we hope you don't presume ours. We have worked hard down here. Uh, we're going to continue to work hard, and we're going to continue to do what we're doing. So we appreciate the time today. We appreciate the opportunity to talk. Thank you. Yeah. Um, as, as you all may or may not, this is a work session, so there's no decisions that can be made one way or the other. Um, yeah. and, and typically, we'd probably go to some commissioners, but I'm kind of thinking at this point, because we have a lot of people here from the public that we, I'd like to kind of hear because they have some different 
perspectives, you know, from the individual food pantries so that um, we can then, you know, discuss it all and, and get all the, all the questions out in front of us uh, going forward. Mr. Chair, there, but there are some uh, uh, that people have brought up that I had questions that maybe they can be addressed before the public comes up. There's a couple that um, I, and it's three questions I well, have. I think we all have questions. Yeah, okay. we all have well, questions. we'll do it that way, but I think, you know. And I, I won't push my button again, I promise, just once. <laughs> okay. I would rather because, hear from the people first. Well, you know, because can. otherwise, you know, we're not going to, once the public comes and speak, we're not going to get into a, a constant no. rebuttal with them. Right. Uh, we'll be here right. till 7 o'clock tonight. Oh, I agree. Okay, so if you want to ask your questions yeah. to the people that have talked thus far, that's fine, mm -hmm. but keep them short, mm -hmm. and then we'll, you know, keep moving forward so we can, I'm you know, listen. get as much information as we can. I just felt that I'd like to hear from all the, the people that are, were affected by it and then have questions, mm -hmm. but, you know, if you want to, you, think, so you we know. So get their questions well, answered. So, we will. So uh, go I, ahead, Carol. Okay, I'm sorry, but I had I listened to both, and I just want uh, my, our county's perspective before we go further, because there's a lot of my friends in the audience, and I just want these questions answered, and I have a right to. So not you, Mr. Chair. Um, does the county, um, I guess I'm going to ask the attorney maybe, does the county have any authority to make the grocery stores give to our local food bank? Um, are we involved at all in Manatee County government, do we have that authority? I, I know the answer, but I think some people need to hear that because I've had a lot of people say, you need to do something. And uh, is this Chair, a program that we oversee the in the county? The question is no. Okay. Um, the cost of the, the food bank, um, when I did ask what I met with um, the, the food bank, I asked how much it costs to run the, the local food bank, and then when it's time for you guys to come up, Mary Beth, I want you to confirm it. It's about $900,000. Um, and I'm thinking, okay, we have all these community people in the, uh, that spoke before. Just so you know, this is what it costs to run it, and I think people do need, need to know that because maybe we can get some help in the community. Um, and then I also um, want to make sure that is it in fact true, and I heard um, somebody from uh, Tom speak from uh, the food uh, from Feed in Tampa Bay, is it, I'd like somebody to confirm it again, is it true that the USDA, that you are under the Feeding America and then they gave you the contract and you have the USDA contract, correct? Yes. I, I think you said yes, just yes or no, and I'll say yes for the record or no. Yes. Okay, thank you. And I just also want to mention, I've been part of the food bank for years. I actually did the summer school thing, and Cindy knows me well. We started the animal thing. So uh, this is very emotional to all of us, but um, we also got a, a we're, we're kind of like in the middle of a big fight here. That's how I perceive it. I've met with both sides. And I just want to know what our role is, and I want I thank the attorney for clarifying it. That's all I had to say, and I won't say any more. Get the public, you want to go ahead and comments um yeah i'll just be real quick too um but other people on the board too um obviously we're in a learning mode here because what i think i know is probably as much as what i don't know quite mm -hmm. frankly um you know i always thought that our food bank of manatee county worked with these partners i've been to events for the food bank i participated mm -hmm. In events i've you know delivered food on meals on wheels honestly I had no idea about feeding tampa bay so then I learned that it's really this big oversight, and if I say anything wrong, you guys can both come up here and correct me because I'm in a learning mode. That's all I can be in, in, in a discussion mode with our community. I, that's where I see us, okay? So um, I learned that actually there is this thing called Feeding America, and this is the group that actually, it, it, Feeding Tampa Bay has always been the group, and they had an agreement with our food bank, and that's how it operated previously. Right, right, okay. But now there is not that agreement anymore. So Feeding Tampa Bay still has the contract with all of these um, places that provide the food. I was glad that you explained that it was more than just grocery stores and there's other resources, and that makes sense to me. But the, the question is, is what happens to our food bank and all of our partners who have always operated this way? It's such a big change, and... We have all heard from them. They're just having such a hard time working with this. So when I hear things like it is a new model, 
can't do anything about it, that this is how it is, the food does stay here. So I have a question. So how does it stay here? It do, so how, and I guess I have to ask Feeding Tampa Bay, how does it stay here? Where does it go when it stays here? So uh, this is what I'm picturing in my mind, that you have a big truck that goes around and picks up all this food and it stays here. But where? I, I don't know if it doesn't go to the food bank, where does it go when it stays here? Can I get that answer? Mm -hmm. They deliver it to the pantry. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes. <laughs> and I really appreciate everyone being here. I don't want to put blame on anyone. We just have a very big change in circumstances, and I'm just trying to understand it, even though we don't have a direct role. All right, so to answer your question, generally speaking, food is picked up and then delivered to certain agencies. We do have agencies here that are working with us. Okay. Right, so there are plenty that we've partnered with. We've also partnered with new agencies and new partners, and so that food still stays here. We use those. I think at last count we were partnering with 25 or 26 agencies. I don't remember the number, but uh, so we're pushing out food through those partners as well as new ones. Okay, okay. So there's no, there's no like, freezer here or area where it's being stored or like there was at the food bank at so one time. I think one of the challenges, and we've talked about this with you commissioners, and we've talked to some of our agency partners about this, but again, for the record, one of the great changes in food relief has been that most of the food that's going to be donated to us and is donated to us is perishable. We have to move that food as expeditiously as possible to get it on to tables of families. One of the things that we focused on is delivering to more agencies. We Again, we understand in certain instances that has been not exactly what folks want. They're used to going and shopping, and folks don't always get exactly what they used to get. But this is what's going to be donated. It's one of the reasons why I mentioned USDA food, that lovely shelf-stable boxes and cans that all of us in food banking love. That will continue to reduce. And we're all going to have to deal with perishable. And perishable, generally speaking, as a rule, you have to move it somewhere between 8 and 30 hours maximum. You do not want to store it. You want to get it on to uh, folks' tables. So that is what happens. And that's been an adjustment not only here in Manatee County, it's been an adjustment across the entirety of our service territory. And as a percentage of food grows, the percentage of perishable food will grow commensurately. And so this puts more and more pressure on all of us to move food more quickly. And that, that in some ways, uh, changes how you store food and how you manage food in the ways that you used to. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask um, Mary Beth if you might say, I mean, w w what I hear is that we have a new model and we can't do anything. We have a lot of frustrated people. I'm, I'm so sorry, did you say I said that? No, no, I asked Mary Beth. Um, that's what I heard. I wrote it down. We have a new model and we can't do anything. Um, so what, 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 I, what can we do? I, I, I don't agree with that. I, you know, we've got a lot of people. We've got food insecurity. We have, if I understand correctly, we're trying to get more food into our community. How could we redo this so that we can all work together? Don't know. I mean, so I, when yeah, I it's said, not our responsibility. Just, per se. just to clarify, okay. when I said that there's nothing we can do, what I meant is that the decisions to award the USDA contract to Tampa, we had no control over that decision. That was done by Harry Chapin Food Bank, mm -hmm. which is um, appoint. He is uh, the executive director is appointed by the Commissioner of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. right. So we had no choice in that matter. We also had no choice when. Feeding Tampa Bay elected to terminate our contract to pick up the retail store as part of the Feeding America contract as well. So that's what I meant. Um, I would like to comment that the USDA contract, we service 55 pantries in Manatee County. So I know Thomas is saying there's 20 or 25 that are listed. There's a lot more that we're picking up USDA and picking it up locally. And the beauty of picking it up locally is they can pick it up when they're doing their distributions, when they have their volunteers, and when they have storage capacity. So those are very important features that are a change to this um, arrangement. So I hope that clarifies so, it. So if you could do, if you could change this, what would you change and how could we help change it? 
I would get the USDA contract back to the food bank at Meals on Wheels Plus of Manatee. We would operate that and retain it in our warehouse if, if that's what could happen. And the same thing with the Feeding America program. But we understand those, those decisions have been made and the only person who can change it now is Commissioner Freed. So, but we have let the community know and Commissioner Freed the circumstances here in Manatee County. This is the commissioner of the Department of Agriculture, Agriculture. which is yes. a federal program. And so you're working with your representation on, in we Congress? We are working with our state representatives, correct. State representatives. Mm -hmm. And when the, even though it's a federal program, when it comes into the state of Florida, it is administered through the Department of Agriculture. And they determine who the contract administrator is. And in our case in Manatee County, that's the Harry Chapin Food Bank down in Fort Myers who is also a Feeding America affiliate. Okay. And what's the difference with um, All Face Food Bank, for example? So All Face Food Bank has a contract under Feeding America for two counties. So they are a direct member, as is um, Feeding Tampa Bay, as is Harry Chapin. They have multiple counties and they have a direct contract to pick up food in the counties under their contract. So that contract is through that food bank and Feeding America National. Got it. And is there anyone that does that in just one county? Is there anyone that has just a single county? Um, not that I know of. Okay. I think direct members typically have more than one county, So, okay. which is why Sarasota has two, and they're a direct member. And in order for us to go with Sarasota, for example, what would that take? That would take Feeding Tampa Bay to allow us to move the contract underneath and the county underneath um, all face food bank and we did request that way back when well, way back when yes okay. two years so ago when yes. the contract was originally cut off uh, actually before that okay yeah mm -hmm. okay all right well um, again I'm just learning with y'all so yeah and just bear with me just for the the record to recap that is the I was trying to get to that point the, the course of events um, we had issues at the food bank we knew we were gonna have to go to the community and ask for donations to redo the food bank um, we knew we only had one year left in our contract under Feed America Tampa Bay we went to them our, our one of our major um, board members is also a major donor under Susie Bowie's uh, Community F Foundation. He was the one that asked us to align with Sarasota County All Face. They had just been given a 40,000 square foot state of the art building. They're 11 miles from us. It just made more sense to be aligned with Sarasota. So we had a two part conversation with Feed America Tampa Bay. We asked number one, could we be released? Could you give the county? over to All Faiths, that would allow us to build a much smaller food bank just for the refrigerated items and then we could daily pick up from Sarasota, again, 11 miles. Or two, will you give us an extension on the contract so that we can go in good faith to the community and ask for these additional funds? We were terminated. Huh. Well, we know where we are today and I guess what I'm trying to get at and I'm sure we're gonna hear because I've seen the emails, I've seen the letters, I've read them all, I have a file of all of them, um, of the uh, frustration. So I'm just trying to figure out, since you're here, before the government, it's not our responsibility, but you know, the people of Manatee County are our responsibility. So um, I'll look forward to hearing from folks. Thank you, Good comment. Commissioner Bellamy? No, I think we need to hear from the public, too. Okay. Mr. Chair. Good. Commissioner Servia. Thank you, sorry, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions too. So I spent my morning <clears throat> this morning at the 53rd Avenue Church of Christ where I saw them hand out over 200 boxes of food and I saw people stand in line and I saw the need and I talked to numerous people. I talked to two guys that lived together in a car. One used to be an executive. I talked to a grandfather who was raising two kids. I talked to a vet. Uh, who used to be in the Marines and is uh, struggling to get food. Um, and I'll tell you what, you want to see what love looks like, go to one of those churches and take a look because all of the people there were so grateful and so appreciative and so needed. <coughs> all right, so here are my questions. It seems like there's a, such a huge need that there's plenty of room for everybody to work together. I mean, that seems pretty clear to me. 
Um, but so I have a question for the Food Bank of Manatee. Tell me, what is your biggest fear with this new model? What is your biggest fear? That there might be a natural disaster and the food can't get here? Or, I mean, I'm trying to understand. Yes. Um, our biggest fear and concern is that the people who need the food are getting the food. And if there's only 20 pantries or 25 being serviced, the larger ones, I'm very concerned about the smaller ones. They can't take weekly drops. And, and really, I'm speaking on their behalf, but they're all here, so they really need to speak, speak up and tell you. So my concerns are their concerns. Okay, and then for Feeding Tampa Bay, I have a, qu a question, please. And you said that you oversee 10 counties, is that right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess I can assume that you're experiencing the same sort of problem in the community in all the counties that you're serving. And how are you dealing with that? Uh, so your question is, are we seeing this in other counties? The answer is yes, right? So, um, you know, for us... Uh, our model is built uh, much like Food Bank of Manatees is or any other partner in the, in the food relief uh, community. Uh, we're built on uh, the ability to move food both through partners, which are agencies, as well as other resources. Part of what we believe is we have to develop other resources. But I want to be really clear to this commission and to the group at large. We'd like to work with as many agencies as are willing to work with us. We're happy to have those conversations. And so some have chosen to come along and some have not. But we're confident that we can feed the community and we're confident that we can bring more food into the community. So we remain really positive about that and we, main, we really hope that Food Bank of Manatee can continues to do what they're doing, which is find food, locate it, bring it into the community, and we'll do the same. And if it works well, we ultimately hope that more people are fed. That really should be the goal, and we're uh, happy to be a part of that mix. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Vanessa? Um, I'm sorry. If you could go back up to it, because my questions are for you. I apologize. And, and I have a little bit of laryngitis today, so bear with me. Um, I, I just... I, I was on the board with Meals on Wheels for several years, worked with Bambi. Uh, she was not the chair at the time, but our state representative, Will Robinson, was on there when I left. Um, at any rate, you've made a couple of, uh, I just need to kind of figure out what your thoughts are and where you're coming from, because I am concerned. I know how the food bank works. I've worked many days there uh, over the years, and so I, I'm very familiar with what they do. I've also, so you know, I've had uh, meetings with the pantries in my district, and I've heard from all of them. Um, so you made the comment, if I may just ask, because it bothered me. You said it two or three times about how you feel like that in the future um, the amount of food is going to decrease, okay? Um, so from that those, is... From those two sources. I understand. Okay. And that's very concerning to me because we, I know that not just in my district, but all over the county, people are complaining that, I know you, you talked in pounds, but I think really maybe you could address, you know, to say that all these pounds of food were brought into Manatee County is good, but I also know that a lot of times the pantries, they're not getting the food they need. So it sounds good that you can bring in, you know, 11 million pounds you know, in a year or something, but unless they're really getting the food they need, it doesn't serve the purpose because I've heard that a lot of the food that is coming in that's being delivered to them is not what they've ordered and it's not what they need. Right. And so, that's my, just, if I can just, please. so that you can maybe answer it all at one time for me. Mm -hmm. um, I also didn't hear you say anything about how much money uh, the food cost, and I don't know if it's every food bank that has to pay, but I do know that some do. Uh, they pay your organization for the food. Um, so I didn't hear anything about that. Just to give you an idea of kind of what I'm looking at here. Um, and, and you did say, and maybe, I, maybe you can help me. I want to make sure I heard you correctly because I'm not 100% today. Did you say that all the food that is picked up from, say, Publix, et cetera, in Manatee County. Is all that food uh, delivered to the food banks in Manatee County, or is it taken up to Tampa and used there? It's delivered in Manatee County. And you, you can verify all that? You have documentation? Uh, yes, I would imagine we can. I could go back through and look at that, but uh, we're comfortable that that happens. If you think about it in this way, 
Uh, and it's going to get back to your first point in a moment. If you look at it in this way, for us to move food is about 55 cents a mile. So it doesn't make sense for us to do that. We try and keep everything locally. And again, I want to reiterate, this isn't just a Manatee County program. This is something we do across all of our 10 counties. It's a smart way to run your business. I'm only concerned about Manatee. I'm sorry. I understand that. I'm trying okay. to give you reference so okay. you don't think it's a unique circumstance here. <coughs> Let me discuss food because I think every single agency that we deal with, all 550 across all of our 10 counties, across the state of Florida and across the United States, are struggling with what food can be found. Remember that what we're delivering is what's donated to us, right? So when folks say, I want peanut butter, or I want a can of soup, or I want uh, protein, or I want more of particular items, those don't exist at quantities that people want or need, not for anywhere. One of the questions I was asked, which was really a surprise, were we pulling all the good food out of Manatee County and bringing it back up to Hillsborough? Uh, the answer to that is no. So the food donated is changing more and more and more. It's one of the reasons why I highlighted what's happening with USDA and with grocery stores. So the food we deliver is the food that we have. And we do the same across all of our counties. And so what is donated here generally stays here. What we bring in from outside is what we can get our hands on. And sometimes that is really terrific stuff that meets the need exactly. And sometimes it is too much produce at one time. Uh, sometimes it is not exactly the produce that folks want. We understand that, and we don't want any agency partner or individual that receives food not to get food that's helpful to them. So we know that that happens. But again, I want to reiterate, we're donating what is available. This has continued to change in our community, and we're simply reacting to those changes. So we do not... Um, parse out or separate out good versus bad, we donate what's available to us. And as I want to remind the commission again and again, this is going to continue to evolve. So if you're in a food bank of another five years from today, right now we're at about 70%, 75% of our food is perishable. In another five years, probably 80 to 85% of our food will be perishable. And it'll be food coming out of farms, places like that. We'll see less and less that comes out of the retail sector. So, all right, let me, if I may, um, and then maybe you can answer some of these other things I brought up. Um, the food that is collected in Manatee is what the food is that you're saying the pantries in Manatee are receiving. Yes. Because I, I, the reason I'm asking that question is because uh, of all the, the pantries in my district, and there were, at, to be honest, there were more than I thought there were, uh, they all said the same thing, that they're not receiving the food that they need. Um, and so that being said, I know you, you made the comment, I wrote it down, um, that your organization is built like Manatee is. Okay, but then you also said, this I need help with, you also said that um, it cost about 55 cents a mile. Okay, how far, how many miles are you just from Tampa Bay to, to Manatee County? 34, 35, I think. 34, Somewhere 35 miles. Okay. I think from our warehouse down From your warehouse. Yeah. Okay, that bides my next question. And I'm sure we'll all have more questions to ask as this moves along this afternoon. Um, I, 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 I've got to ask you then, why would you not, and I don't know if allow is the right word, why would you not let Manatee County go with Sarasota like they ask, and Sarasota had liked that idea and wanted that to happen as well, if, if your goal is truly to feed as many of our citizens that need feeding, which I can tell you, I would probably surprise this board at how much I do know about that, um, why would you stand in the way of letting them go to Sarasota where more of our people can get the food they need like they're accustomed to getting in the past, why would you stand in the way of that? Uh, so I want to say a couple of things. I hope that's fair. I, I didn't mean it to be rude. No, I think, I think there's clearly some agenda here. We'll make our way through it and we'll show no, up and answer. No, I'm just at, because I want to know the answer. I don't understand, I understand that. that. So we'll litigate in public our relationship with Food Bank of Manatee. But suffice to say that the decision we made we made for very good reasons. Our board took it seriously, and we feel good about that decision. We regret that decision, but we feel very strongly it was the right decision. We've not said anything publicly about that, nor do we plan to do that. Right? Oh Secondarily, God. to your question specifically, <laughs> I'm sorry, am I saying something? Yeah, right? you floored me with that one, but anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. You flo I didn't expect you to say that. <laughs> the second thing that I would say about this um, 
as we look at our responsibility to the community and where Manatee County lies. Manatee had been a part of our food service territory for many, many years. <coughs> it didn't change last week. This isn't something that we would want to enter into lightly or quickly, and it's something that we might consider over the fullness of time, but right now we don't think it's the right thing to do. One of the things we would remind all of you is that we have resources we can bring from all of our other eight or nine counties, and they help and uh, our value to Manatee County. And so we feel strongly that the setup as it exists today is a good setup. So uh, if I may then, in response to what you just said, as my voice is cracking, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know why I woke up with this. Um, so you're saying that your, your board's decision to have Manatee Food Bank in, in or yeah, food bank under your organization was done for the right reasons, but we don't know what it is because we're not going to litigate it today. I, I understand. But in all fairness, I have a, um, an obligation to my constituents. And so I can tell you two things. Number one, if that's the case, I would love to have a meeting with you and Mary Beth both together because I want to know what those reasons are. Number two, that still doesn't explain to me why they couldn't go with Sarasota instead of your organization. Because we feel strongly that they've been a part of our ser service territory for many, many years, and we feel like it's the best fit for Manatee County. Well, that's good. I'm glad that you're thinking about what the best fit is for our county, but I can tell you you got a lot of people here that don't agree with that. So I don't know that. what the answer is, but it would seem to me you wouldn't want to stand in the way of this county, and I mean no disrespect when I say that. Please believe me. But my job, <coughs> they voted for me, and, and I represent them. So that's all I'm asking is why. Um, because if they don't want to be with your organization, why would Tampa feel that they can be better stewards of the people in our county that are hungry than what the people here that live here, the organizations that's here that's done it for many years, and Sarasota? Why do you all feel better? You're so much more suited to do it when you're 34, 35 miles away. 45? I mean, that's what I'm saying. It just, I don't understand that. So if you don't mind, I really would. If, if that's going to be your stance with this board, I would love to have a meeting with the two of you because I want to know the answers to that. Please, with all due respect. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Trace. Yeah, I just have more of an observation. Um, Feeding Tampa Bay said that they're cooperating. They're leaving all our food here in the county. Okay. I'm happy with that because uh, to be honest Publix has been hitting me up for two cans a week for quite a while now yeah. um, <laughs> and I ask them every time I said this isn't going to Tampa it's staying right here in Manatee County and they told me yes it is and I'm like yeah alright um, <coughs> but somebody's been getting two cans a week for quite a while um, you said that you're That's handling me. 20 to 25 uh, <laughs> agencies are working with you Mary Beth and them said they used to work with 80 so my question is where is the food going you said that it's all going to Manatee County. Does that mean the 20 to 25 are getting that much more food? And if, you, if you're doing the 20 to 25, why can't that extra food go to the bank and let the people that are only feeding 50 people a week pick their food up just like they always did? I mean, I'm not the brightest person. I've just been out in the field working, which makes you, you know, not real bright to start with. Um, instead of having one of these air-conditioned jobs. But, I mean, it just, a it just doesn't add that up. Solution. That's all I'm saying. You know, 80, 80 people used to get it, now only 20 to 25. Or there's got to be yeah, some extra food. Or those 20 to 25 need to start sharing with the other 60. I mean, it's a math problem. Just say it. And I do know the farmers in Manatee County aren't real happy about this either. They're talking about only letting the, their product go to Manatee County because they're like farm bureaus asking me, and I'm like, I don't know, it's some kind of fight going on. It's feuding between the banks, and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But I just don't understand where the extra food is going. If they used to take care of 80 and you're only taking care of 20 and all the food is staying in Manatee County, I'm sorry, that in my mind doesn't add up. Just an observation. That's what I was asking. I would that's what I wanted. Try to answer you want that to add? at all. You wanted. You didn't hear you. Do you want to make an answer? Do you want to reply to that question at all, or? Well, really, it's more just. You know, it's not. Yeah, I don't. Well, you want a different between the bank and the pantry? 
I'm saying. Yes. I would reiterate, we're happy to work with any agencies. So remember, there's not nearly enough food in Manatee County to begin with, and so if there are more agencies that want to partner with us, we'd be happy to do that. Some agencies chose not to partner with us. We That's certainly great. asked them to do that, but they've chosen not to. But all the 25-plus agencies and other organizations we're working with, we're moving all the food through them. Remember, there is a significant gap of some 11 million pounds missing every year. There's plenty of opportunity. Uh, so if other partners want to work with us, we'd be more than pleased to work with them. Well, the ones I have talked to that are small are having a problem. They can't re they don't handle your criteria for being and your charge and deliveries, which they aren't so, big enough and they want to be able to go somewhere local and pick up what they need. And you and I have talked about that. And I said, my people would be okay if you had a place in South um, Ruskin area. My people are closer to Ruskin, actually, than they probably are to the food bank in Manatee County. You asked that question earlier, so let me come back and so. uh, answer that. Uh, so uh, food banking, as it was originally set up, had a program called sharing fees. Mm -hmm. And sharing fees could come in a couple of different forms, but sharing fees were set up because the idea was the food bank would not bear the cost of the entire distribution model, though they did most of the work. And so Feeding America had a convention in place, still does today, that you can charge up to 19 cents a pound for food. And that can be charged in two ways. One is if you come and you get food or food is delivered to you, you can weigh it out and say you have this much food and that's the cost of it. Right. There are also conventions where we charge delivery fees that, again, operate on a per pound basis. So I assume Food Bank of Manatee used a per pound the Feeding America convention in the time that they were Feeding America Food Bank. We use something similar to that, though we don't use a per pound unless someone shops. We use for some of the partners that are here for uh, food, we use a delivery fee. And so we try and manage that as best we can. We bear most of the cost of the distribution, uh, but we do ask agencies to participate in that, just as they did when they worked under Food Bank of Manatee. They participated in the, I assume, again, Mary Beth would have to answer that, I assume paid a per pound charge as well for uh, sharing costs. One again, because I was asked this, make sure they reiterate, for USDA food, no charges can be um, applied for delivery of that food, right? So USDA reimburses separately for that. So if an agency gets food through or gets USDA food, they can't be charged that. Okay. Oh, okay. My button's still on. I need to say something, Chair. He, he wants to talk. Yeah. Okay, you want to say, okay. Well, I, I initially, and again, I, I, well, not again, I apologize for being late. Um, we, we had a town hall meeting about this, and a lot of information came out, and there was a lot of um, communication and frustration with, with concerns. And I think um, where we are right now, we're trying to identify, you know, what are the next steps uh, for, for Food Bank Manatee. Um, one thing that I said when this first came out, is what I do not want or do I, I think this board and our community do not want is for individuals um, that are in need not being served. And, and I think that's our, um, all of our concern uh, with this particular issue. Um, there was a question that came up um, at one of my town hall meetings that I want to ask. Do we have CPS representation here? Um, thank you. All right. And the, one of the questions that were brought up was CPS emergency food baskets that are needed to families, and they said 89 families, am I correct, um, at that particular time, um, to feed over 300, 300 people. Is there a, a, a model, does your model support um, a situation or a scenario like that um, from, from feeding Tampa Bay? And the reason why I'm, why I'm asking is because now we're talking about kids <laughs> not being fed. And um, I'm not necessarily sure if I'm saying it the right way, were you the young lady that asked me the question from CPS, ma'am? You were, you were not, are you familiar with that situation? Yes, Mr. Chair, is it okay if she speaks on it? Okay, can you come forward, ma'am, and speak on it? And, and that's just the beginning. And, and make sure you state your name for the record. And I do have a lot more comments that I have to make, but I kind of wanted to hear from the, the public at first. But well, since everyone else is going in their direction, I need to make sure I stand on mine also. To me, that'd be nice to hear from the public. Yeah, but we tried that once, you Mr. Chair. Like that my didn't, idea. Didn't work. So. Can, can we talk about the can we talk about the CPS um, scenario, ma'am? Certainly. My name is Nina Miller. Child Protective Services. Oh. I'm with Child Protective Investigative Services. I am a transporter for CPS. So myself and my two partners, we uh, specifically go to the pantries and pick up the food baskets and we deliver them to the homes of our families in need. 
whether the case comes in through the hotline um, and we're doing an investigation on abuse, neglect, or whatever. Um, sometimes our cases come in just as families in need of services and they just need food, mm -hmm. um, other resources in the community. And if it may be a food basket or a baby basket, a child under the age of two years old is um, able to get a food, a baby basket. And if the supplies are available, they can get one once a week, um, as long as we have a case open. And our food baskets, um, they give us, <coughs> I've been working with the agency for 14 years and I have seen the baskets come down in size, go from boxes, banana boxes, to paper bags. Oh, my. Yeah, because it's good. So, uh, and, and I don't want to, and, and again, I know there's a lot of emotions and thanks for all you all yeah. do. But um, for, sir, is, is, does your model have the ability to support that? You got to come down. Your, your model, and maybe we should just give you a chair right here, um, because you're definitely getting your steps in for the day. I can guarantee you that. You don't have to jog later. <laughs> so um, again, I want to make a general remark that the food that is in Manatee County is, right, the same number of folks are getting fed, right? And so what happens is how is it distributed and who is it distributed to, right? And what are the programs that do that? So do we do programs like that in other places? We do. If it's necessary for us to participate in that here, that's great. Or maybe Food Bank of Manatee wants to work closely with those folks. I think both can happen. But do we do that in other places? The answer is yes. We work in some places with ambulance services, with police departments, yes. Uh, and I think it speaks to, Commissioner, to a whole other part of the conversation we're having. So. Uh, I'll just illustrate a story that changed our thinking about how we approach food relief. As you again, I want you to understand how we look at this. For many years, we provided backpacks on Friday evenings to kids at school, right? And so we really thought this was a good way to connect with children and a way to get food into the home. Because teachers were saying to us, hey, kids are hungry, and when you see them on Monday, you can't, you can't teach them because they're right there, right? So we did that for many years. I think, again, you all have a program similar, right? We thought very highly of that program, had a lot of funders that loved it. It was a great way to take care of children. About three years ago, we did some extensive study work with USF to understand whether those programs were effective. And we found a couple of things that were interesting to us that really started to change our thinking about how we approached this. And this talks about all modeling, right? One is that we found that a lot of the food we gave out wasn't necessarily um, socially appropriate for families, right? So it might not have fit an ethnic need or want, right? So for example, we did one of the studies in South County of Hillsborough where there's a lot of migrant labor and we were giving kids granola bars and the kids were like, we don't eat these. Oh, right. that's true. Second thing that we found which really changed our thinking was 68% of all backpacks were eaten on Friday night by the entire family. Mm -hmm. So what we thought little Bobby and Susie were going home and spending the weekend and hiding that food away, they're eating it that night with their family because the entire family's hungry. Mm -hmm. Since then, we've opened 25, almost 30 now, pantries inside schools mm -hmm. because that's where families are going and that's where they can get food. I think I've mentioned each of you individually. We've started to work with Pinellas County Transportation Association to put food pantries with bus services. So I think for all of us, we're trying to figure out how to do this differently. I mention these specifically because of the program that's very important to make sure that we take care of children who are in crisis or families who are in crisis. Part of our responsibility, I'm sure exactly what Food Bank of Manatee feels like, is we have to step into that crisis or that situation and find a way to respond. Do I have an answer as to how we would do that with this organization right now? I don't, but I would tell you we're happy to sit down with them and see if we can help meet that need for them. Okay, and what I'm gathering from, from all of this is we, we still have the need, we, we still have the need, but we still have all entities will, willing to identify ways to work so the impact can take place. Um, and this is no shot at anybody, but this is just how I feel. As adults, all us are adults in the room, sometimes we have to humble ourselves and put our egos to the side and do what's best for the needy. And I think that message is for all entities in here. Um, from the government standpoint, I think we are limited on what we can do, but we still can show our concern and our, our support. Um, out of the 75 uh, food banks and um, food pantries, and I learned that 45 were in District 2, 
um, if you didn't come to my office, I was going to come to yours, to be honest with you, because that, that was my concern about the, the, the entire situation. And again, we have no action steps that we, that we can take um, from, the, from the board. But I do want to, and this will be my final comments, uh, Mr. Chair, I do want to say this right here. Take advantage of the opportunity to work with each other and, and, and stay away from the egos and the attitudes and the frustration. If you, if you, if you move in a, with a mindset of saying we're going to make sure we do what we need so we can make an impact, it'll go a lot further. Uh, right now, I think all of the communications and the conversations are led by emotions mm -hmm. and, and frustration instead of led by what are our options? What can we do to make sure we work? I think there are um, internal, and what I mean by internal is in the county, collaborating opportunities that need to be um, challenged. And what I mean by that, smaller entities can actually communicate with some of the larger ones and to make sure that they're getting fed. I'm not necessarily sure how that looks, but that's something that we may need to look into. We, he's going back wherever he's from, and God bless you with safe travels and everything like that, but we have an, op we have an obligation to make sure we impact our community. And, and I'm sure everybody's in here because they take that obligation um, serious. So within us taking that obligation serious, how about we communicate within each other internally and find out ways that we can collaborate internally and say, hey, we're going to make a stance and we're going to make this happen. How many millions of food or pounds of food are left that we can't identify? Let's identify that and find ways to distribute it amongst our community so we can address the need and um, find ways to make that impact. That's, that's, that's the direction that I'm going to lean toward. That's good points. Commissioner Ball. Yeah, I just wanted to okay. say if we could go to uh, the, the citizens that are here, we need to hear from them. Mm -hmm. Because I think what Com uh, Commissioner Bellamy said, you know, sounds wonderful, but let's make sure that's a possibility. Be. Because we still have that obligation to the citizens themselves. So if we could, uh, Mr. Chairman, go to citizen comment. Roll here. Commissioner Benack. Yeah, we've obviously identified that we have a shortage. 11 million. We have a need. We have a big shortage. we got to figure out how to solve this. I don't know <coughs> that, that feeding Tampa Bay is the answer, but I don't know that they're bad either. I mean, that's what I'm hearing here, and so we are going to have to work together to figure this out. So I look forward to hearing from the community that works on this every single that's day. That's what I was thinking, too. Yeah. Okay. Well, we will now open this up to public comment. Uh, those of you who would like to come up and maybe just line up on the... Uh, I'll weigh there, and you'll each have three minutes to, uh, you know, give us some more insight that I think we're all looking for as to Shirley. your experiences. Hey, you could be the first. Come on up. Looking good, girl. Looking yeah, good. look at her. <laughs> you can be done if they work out. Trust me. First, I want to say... Um, Get your name, hon. Okay. My name is Shirley Pearson, and I serve as uh, Executive Director at Mount Carmel Community Resource Center in Palmetto. And I want to say special, extra special thank you to the Vanity County Commissioners for listening and trying to help us work this situation out. Because I know personally that your hearts are in the community. And because you have worked with my organization for years, and I just want to say thank you for that, and thank you for being here today to listen to us. I really appreciate that. Oh, okay. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Love you. Okay. Um, what my major concern is, and I don't want to put anybody down or... I don't want to um, uh, say this or that, but my concern is is that we serve homeless and we serve like low income, and then we reach out into the community to um, help young couples. <laughs> mm. I went to uh, Mills on Wheels this morning, and um, there was hardly anything there, you know. And I'm thinking, okay, my organization is a small organization, and we don't have the fees. And my understanding that it costs like $130 to bring a truck full of food to our center, you know, per week. And we don't have that kind of funds uh, to do that. 
And we got we served people meals every single day, and the girls were concerned this morning at the center. You know, they were saying that, um, you know, the pulled pork, you know, that is commodity food, or some of the food that we had was getting low, and um, and their concern was what we was going to do. My thing is, and I agree with Commissioner Bellamy and all the other commissioners, let's come up with a plan that's going to work, that's going to be beneficial for these organizations in this community. You know, we, we need help right now. We've always worked with uh, Meals on Wheels, and we could just go over there. We don't have the refrigeration to store a lot of food and, and all this kind of stuff. They have the refrigeration over there. And it's always been beneficial for us, you know. And I'm not trying to hurt or put anybody down, but I'm just talking about what's been beneficial for our organization. And um, so I just want to come up with a plan where we can work together to resolve this issue because it's one that needs to be resolved. The goal isn't us. It's the people that we're serving. I'm sorry, my time is up. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ms. Shirley. Good job. Hi. My name is Sue Philbrick, and I'm with St. George's Episcopal Church on 63rd. We're in Pride Park. We have a pantry uh, twice a month, the first and third Thursdays. And during that hour and a half, we'll serve between 200 and 225 families, equating to approximately 500 people. We have a mixed population. We have a senior uh, restricted income housing center very close to us. And we provide uh, bags of food for 80 uh, units in that place. And then we also have a large Hispanic population. My food costs have gone up 40% if I take the year before we were associated with Feeding Tampa Bay and compare it to the first year we were associated. In other words, the 40% increase is from them to them. And I'm feeding a few more people, but not a whole lot. The cost is one thing. My church can't absorb any more cost. I mean, as it is, we're not fixing the roof, we're feeding people. Those are choices in a small organization like most of these people know, you have to make choices. Are you gonna feed kids or are you gonna feed the seniors? Oh, dear. Aren't they both important? So you have to make choices on where to put your money. What has happened to me and our organization is that having lost the availability to go to Meals on Wheels and get food when I need it has hurt me. Uh, we are registered with the commodity program and we can participate and have elected not to at this point in time the commodities would be delivered, <laughs> I was told, on Tuesday between 9 and 11.30. I'm 68 years old, and I'm one of the kids at our church. <laughs> My people can't give up a, you know, half a day every week to unload a truck. I used to get my commodities every two months, and I could round up enough kids after school or, you know, to get this done to unload five or 6,000 pounds of food, which is what I would take. Um, so that is an issue, and until I can get a crew to unload, I can't accept commodities, because I cannot physically move everything. Mm -mm. Um, and I'm very concerned about the emergency bags, because yesterday I packed up for a mother and five children. We get calls at our church every week People don't have food. They need something. I have to have something in that pantry that I can give them that will feed them hopefully two or three days and try to find out what caused the root cause of the issue, try to get that solved. The availability of food in our community and access to it for our organizations is imperative. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy DiCarlo, and I'm with the Parish United Methodist Church, our food pantry in Parish, Florida. My concern is, as I understand right now, 
We are a lone food pantry in North Country. Um, we're a medium-sized church. And my concern is our shelves are half bare. We are partnering with Feeding America because we have a commitment to the folks that appear at our door every two weeks. We will feed them. We may be taking it off our shelves, but we'll feed them. This pantry program is not the only program that's impacted by this. It impacts every other feeding program that we run out of our church. A school program for the weekend feeding program. Um, we've been blessed. Our congregation and our community is, is just the, the bomb. They're there when we need them. But we need more than that. Because if we are the only food pantry in parish, because the others were too small to be a part of, they weren't able to receive. OK, this is what I'm hearing from them. They weren't able to receive. They don't have the capacity. They don't have storage. I immediately said, send your folks to us or send your food to us. We will do it. But there's guidelines that we have to work under with the USDA food. We cannot share that with any other pantry. Mm -hmm. They couldn't come to us on distribution day and pick up their allotment. Okay? And I understand. There, there are policies, procedures that are in place for food safety and all other reasons. And we work within those guidelines. But we open our pantry doors for the first time with this program this coming Saturday. We have doubled our volunteer staff. <coughs> we have been calling everyone, doing everything that we can individually and collectively to stock the shelves. They'll be bare again. We did get a delivery for USDA food, but it's not a USDA distribution day. Because as we understand the program, they're separate from our donated food for our pantry. So we'll do our best. We'll feed with to the last box, bag, can that we have. But we need help. We need help. Thank you. Thank you. Here, you got it. Yes, my name is Linda Zoberganis. My husband and I manage the pantry for First Presbyterian Church right down here in downtown. Could you pull the microphone down a little bit? There you go. Thank you. I just wanted to say in the month of September, we gave food to 932 people. We have a small pantry. We're open on Tuesday and Thursday between 9 and 12. And we want to continue accommodating that many people. However, if we don't have local resources, it's not going to happen anymore. We need some place that we can pick up food locally. My husband and I go and pick up the food. We bring it to the pantry ourselves. We, we can't take a whole pallet of food because we don't have storage, and we just use non-perishable foods. So we, we do need something local, and we do need to be able to go and pick it up. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Mark McLaughlin. I'm the president of Our Daily Bread and um, have been for 14 years and um, been volunteering since 1988. So we had an incredible relationship with Food Bank of Manatee. We have an incredible relationship with Feeding Tampa Bay. It is, we used to be able to pick up anything we needed. We, we have been blessed for years, but I will tell you the amount of food we're getting and we can store it, that's the difference, okay? And we give to other food banks also. So the answer is, is there has to become, forget about our daily bread, there has to be a collaboration to utilize their refrigeration some way. I don't know how you're gonna do it. That's not, I don't, I'm not the logistics person here. 
But that's what needs to happen. And that's what we need to help these people do so that everybody can be served. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. My name is John Maps. I, uh, I grew up here in Manatee County. I went to school here. I worked here. I've done everything in Manatee County. Um, going to, say, uh, Tampa Bay to even get my food, I, I think it, it relies on inconvenience for me. Because I think back a few years when the uh, hurricane was hitting here, they thought it was coming here. We were one of the, the sites that everybody came to to get food, to make sure they had it in times of the storm. I would never have time to go to Tampa to pick up anything to bring back to Manatee County. So when we're talking about localizing anything in Manatee County, I heard the gentleman say that everything comes, uh, it stays in Manatee County. Well, this is one of the issues that I would have because <clears throat> Anything that, that happens in Manatee County, I don't think it's a concern because uh, I heard the gentleman kept saying territory. But see, this is my place I lived. I grew up here. See, and so it means something to me. And I watched a family come to me the other day. A family of eight had nothing, had nothing. And, and, and if we didn't have the food, because I, like I said, I live in here, I don't live in Tampa. But if I didn't have what I had in there to be able to give them, what have I done? Turn that family away. See, and these are my concerns. It has nothing to do because I, bottom line, this comes down to business and money to me, and I understand that. But, but I'm talking about the citizens of this county. I don't care about Tampa. I don't care about Polk County. I don't care about all of them. I'm talking about Manatee County. And that's where my concern is. See, I got, I got a love for everybody. I don't, have, I don't have a dislike for nobody, but my concerns is Manatee County. And until we, until we look at this issue, because I, I, listen, I can walk in there and Cindy know me by my first name. I know her by her first name. See, so we have a relationship there and understanding that when we come in there, that's what we come to do. I have a old lady that's out there that cannot travel. I have to take food to her. See, so these things are, are concerning to me because now we, 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 to me, we're haggling over nickels and we're not haggling over the right thing to people. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. My name is Susan Bayor. I'm the food pantry director at Journey Assembly of God Church. We're open one day a week now, and we serve, like everybody else, several hundred people <coughs> in, a, in a month's time. Um, We've gone from 1,500 pounds a week to 700, depending on how busy we are and how much we have left from the week before. We're still getting enough food from our food pantry, our food bank. Um, Tuesday, I picked up 800 pounds of food. But we rely on being able to hand pick what we what we get so if there's a case cases or pallets of leftover deli from the grocery store we don't really have a use for that we have families that want to cook and hand picking being local is important we can't drive to tampa we don't spend over a hundred dollars a week in groceries but we're still feeding the people. They leave with four bags of groceries from our pantry. A bag of produce, a bag of meat, frozen meat, a bag that they get to choose from the shelves, not what we give them. So I appreciate y'all, your efforts, you girls. They're amazing. I did not choose to go with Feeding Tampa Bay until I went to one of their local drops and I watched how the food was handled and where it came from. It did not come from Manatee County. It had other counties' names on the label. The meat was inedible. The produce was rotten. And it was, it was not enough to feed a family of two in that box. And I'm a family of four. 
Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jim Schilling. I direct, uh, as Ms. Servi was this morning, 53rd Avenue Church of Christ. Um, the bread basket. We've grown tremendously. I'm now doing about 3,000 people a month out of our food pantry. I like a lot of people. I'm, I have enough size to do storage. I'm going to continue to do some more storage and grow to try to meet the demands. I want to just tell you, I, I am not into this for the passion. You guys both do an outstanding job. I'm looking at this solely as risk, okay? So when it comes to this, in my real world, I'm an airline pilot. That's what I do for real, okay? I am a professional risk manager. Mm -hmm. Every morning I wake up and I look as I cross the ocean, uh, where am I going to land? And I'm managing risk every day. Every oh, my day. God. Okay? <laughs> when it comes to looking at food, I have a problem when I'm down to a single source. Feeding Tampa Bay, you do a great job. A lot of people, I'm going to be honest with you, probably vilify you. I do not do that. Mm -hmm. I do not believe you wake up in the morning with anything other than good intentions. However, I am now a single source to you. Because I get my food solely from you. I no longer can come over here, right around the corner, shop, get what I need, and meet my demands as required. I now have to rely solely upon you. Now, I ask you the question. I call it the Walmart effect. If you go buy tires somewhere, and you buy those tires, and for whatever the reason, the man on the other side of the counter says, I'm not going to sell you tires. Or you say, I'm not going to buy tires. You can buy tires somewhere else. I don't have that anymore. I cannot go anywhere else but you. Now, the scary part about that is, is that if Tampa Bay now decides, for whatever the reason, you're going to deliver on another day, I am beholden to you. I have to change my entire business model to meet you. That's a threat to me. And it becomes difficulty for my people locally. At the end of the day, I have to feed people, period. And I'm passionate about that, and I manage that risk accordingly. So with that in mind, the other piece of this puzzle, and you've all have heard this several times, I will continue to drive to absorb and grow as required. However, a lot of the smaller food pantries are going to be able to do that. I understand, although I can't document it, there have been failures already. I have heard other people that will close shop. When that happens, smaller food pantries go away because of the logistics model. The other piece of this puzzle is they come to me. I now grow. So you have smaller food pantries that are at risk for implosion, larger food pantries at risk of explosion. I cannot absorb. I have to go find more resources, more refrigeration, more money, more people, more volunteers. It's all about risk. The thing at the end of the day is we have to have dual sourcing so that I have the ability to go local and, if required, come from Tampa. Because if something happens, terrorist event, don't care, uh, roads close, hurricanes, and I can't get the food from you, I don't any longer have the backlog of food that I can go out and distribute. It's about risk, and we are risked right now. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. That was pretty clear. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Nadine Deher Adams. I'm a retiree from New York Children's Services, and I work at, as a volunteer as the director of the food pantry at Mount Gilead Church. We're located on 13th Street West in Bradenton. My kudos to Mary Beth and Cindy and everyone who's involved. I serve families. We have a monthly food pantry. When I give a box of food, I'd like to give them something that would last at least three weeks. I see a lot of seniors now raising their grandchildren. They're the only source of care that these children have. When I pack a box of food, I think of what would I like to have to eat if I have nothing. That's how I prepare my food. The limitations, our, our church has not yet joined <laughs> Feed Tampa Bay because of transportation issues, because of the expense involved, because of the timing of delivery, because of lack of volunteers and availability of manpower and help to unload that truck when it arrives at the church. Those are serious critical issues that affect whether or not we can or cannot join Feed Tampa Bay. Um, the local produce that we normally would have seen in our food supply, it's no longer available. The bread, the pastries, the donations from the stores. And we understand what's happening. But what I'm asking is that we look at solutions. We look at finding ways to make sure that when a family comes to a church or an agency for food, 
especially when it's one with senior citizens, everyone is important, that we can provide them a meal. The government food that has changed is the staple in our box. The other stuff we add, without the basic food in the box, what are we doing? You cannot prepare a meal without basics. When you look at nutrition and you look at what, how it's affecting children in the schools, their ability to learn, seniors, their ability to keep their health and maintain a healthy lifestyle, a quality of life, food, availability, resource. We need to focus on the, the solutions. How can we work together to make sure that every agency gets what's needed when it's needed so that it can be given to the people who need it the most. I, up to Monday, I've given out two emergency boxes. Families that did not have. I was cleaning at the church and they just showed up. We have to have availability. We have to have convenience, access, immediate access. When I get a call that there's a family that needs food, I get dressed out of my home get to the church, wait for them, give them the food. I'm just asking. We have so much resource available to us. We have technology. We have networking. We have a willingness and a passion. We can find solutions. We can find solutions. Every dollar is donated in my church to purchase the food. Every person that serves volunteers. But every family, they wait in line. We, we serve for four hours, and in four hours, 90 families, approximately 300 people, are fed. The food goes. We need your help, please. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mike Chartier. I'm uh, with Freedom Gathering Church on 14th Street. And um, a little unique in this and not used to public speaking, but um, four years ago, we began feeding people out of the back of a, uh, a small church there. Uh, it, was a, it was a furniture store at first, but nevertheless, um, and we would cook, get the food, cook the food, buy the food, everything like that. We were feeding 30 people, 40 people. That's grown to where on Thursday, we now feed three to 400 people. They line up going out into the street. Um, you know, we have to, it's still just five of us began this. And if you think about sitting around some restaurant and saying, how about we feed 400 people? It'd be a great idea. Let's do it every week. Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> but it's difficult. Uh, there are shortfalls. But here's my major issue. He was not disingenuous when he said that all the food stays. But the food is just rounded up. Like if you can think, Publix on Cortez, Sam's, and Walmart are picked up and dropped on me. Whatever is there, and if you can think about walking around Sam's and saying, how many avocados in those bins? How many, how many cantaloupes? And I'm getting them, okay? So at first, what I did, and I'm sorry to say this, but what first I did, because contractually I'm under obligation, such and such, I called up Cindy and I said, I've got a box of 865 pounds of zucchini. Holy moly. What do they want me to do with this? <laughs> You know, wouldn't fit in my car to drive it wherever, and where would I drive it, and who could, re and we have 13 refrigerators, four freezers, and we're trying to, you know, to make it work. But last week, I got 1,000 pounds of pastry. My people really are nutrition lead, you know, they need help. They need, we make a hot meal. We make a protein, we make a fruit salad, we make a real salad, we make, and we, we're, we're a soup kitchen in everyone's eyes, and it's, not a glorious op occupation, you know, we're not in it for the glory, but we want to help these people and give them nutritious meals. So I began to drop with Cindy. I'd call her up and say, send over a truck, but don't send over a truck with a big feeding man or Manatee County food bank because I'll get resentment from at least, if not trouble from them. I did it for three weeks. I gave her 860 pounds of zucchini. I gave her 15 cases of pineapples. What am I going to do with 15? I got five people. What am I going to do with 15 cases of pineapples? I got a call from an executive at uh, Feeding Tampa Bay that said, you're not allowed to do that and don't do it anymore. I said, what am I going to do? Call up a pig farmer and put this stuff in the trash cans? 
Commission. We got. Well, I'm sorry to say, but I don't. My options are so limited. So there's the food, but you know, trucking and you know, transportation and refrigeration is all right here, and we're going to you know lose that asset and be stuck at the end of the tether. My trash cans have been too full too many nights with food that would be useful to people. I try to make it useful. I try to get it out the door. I have families that wait now for our deliveries to pick up. I thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Hi. Good evening. My name is Terry Johnson, and I'm the contact person for our food bank, St. John Missionary Baptist Church, Palmetto, Florida. Um, my expressions today, they're positive. Um, and I would like to say to Cindy and to Ms. Mary Beth, you have been so nice to us, and I appreciate that. They let me walk in like I, I'm part of the crew, and I appreciate that, and I will never forget that. Also, we feed about nine to 1,200 people a month, and we will be, we've been blessed with volunteers from other churches, my church and other churches, even from Bradenton. Also, we've been blessed with refrigerator, refrigerators, and um, I think we got another one on the way. My problem, I, I was telling Cindy, was I was worried about the price, worried about going to Tampa, picking up food. But we got together with our pastor and our volunteers and some of our church members, and we decided, okay, we're going to we're gonna try to make this work. And that's what we did. We came together. And I tell you, at first, I didn't think I would like feeding Tampa Bay. But I do. I really do. And I met Scarlett. Scarlett has been very nice to St. John Missionary Baptist Church. And the driver, I think his name is Ricky or whatever. Um, and I'm not putting anything towards you, Cindy and Mary Beth, but it's, it's, it's just true. They have been nice, and we tried to be nice to them. And all of the items that we have gotten, we could use, and we can use more because we feed people. I just took some baskets out this morning before I came here. Anybody that wants a basket can come to St. John Missionary Baptist Church and get it. And we also feed kids on Wednesdays. You go there today, you'll find some kids coming from uh, going to youth church, and we feed them too. Was it a large group or small group? Also, we give out baskets to seniors. So all my uh, feelings are positive with feeding Tampa Bay. I don't have a problem with them. As long as they keep giving us good food to people, because I don't want to give them anything that I don't want to eat. And we've been getting good food, and they've been treating us nice and fair with us. And I still go out to Cindy and patronize her. And I'm going to continue to do it if she let me. <laughs> so thank you. Cindy will let you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, I'm, my name is Lou Neary, and with Resonate Life Church on 53rd Ave. Uh, we've had a food pantry for about a year now, and we went from zero to about feeding close to 18,000 people this year. Oh, wow. And we've got a lot of growing pains, uh, space requirements. Um, we have a mix of people that come to our food pantry. Uh, we have a lot of Homeless people, we don't call them homeless people, we call them in-between homes. Mm -hmm. And it's been very difficult the last four to five months of feeding the in-between homes people because they eat out of a can or out of a packet. But we can't get those packets. We can't get the cans. In the past from Manatee, we were able to get the cans with the pop tops and uh, to we try to give them a nourished meal the best we can. We can always give them junk food, but that's not what we're, we're there for. 
I think in hearing everybody today, I think we have the Home Depot Crowder's Hardware Store Syndrome here, okay? You go into Home Depot, forget about it, okay? You go into Crowder's, they'll tell you right where to go here, how can I help you today? And we've had this luxury with Cindy and her team for many years now, okay? And I think, as this gentleman said here, that we have to work together to try to have both sides here because we need the flexibility. That's, that's what we need. Last year, we gave out 2,500 backpacks to the, the kids at school. Cindy said, hey, Lou, I got uh, snack packs for you. How about putting all the snacks in there? I didn't ask for them. She's, she's part of the team, okay? And I think what Tampa Bay has to do now is to get a little bit closer in each operation because they're all different and not have the Home Depot syndrome that I can't have 3,000 pounds of asparagus on one pallet. What am I going to do with it? And when I ask you, you got tomatoes, you got asparagus, and you've got lettuce. Why can't I have four boxes of each so I can split it out? Well, that's the way we get it out of the, out of the warehouse. Tampa Bay, this is a communication that we have to have with you that you are a little bit more flexible. I know you've got your policies and procedures. I understand we can't mix the USDA food with our normal deliveries. Okay, if the USDA truck is coming to my parking lot, okay, why can't I get a couple of free pallets not charged for delivery? Because in Manatee County, the average church size is about 100 to 150 parishioners, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, the bigger we get, the more cost it's going to be to our, our church. The less pantries we have, they're going to be coming to me now that it's going to cost me more. So we need help from Cindy, and we need help from, from Tampa, and we got to work this out as a team. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good day, everyone. My name is Lenworth Gordon. I'm with Church of Hope, which is in two locations, and we're in the Palmetto location. And... Um, I want to echo everything that has been said. As a matter of fact, if I had waited two more minutes, I wouldn't have had to say anything because he pretty much said <laughs> what I wanted to say, looking at the big box syndrome. Uh, I was told just yesterday that I need to look inward because of a decision I made that affected a couple of volunteers in my pantry. And I kind of feel like the syndrome extends to the level of the directors of Feeding Tampa Bay and the Food Bank of Manatee, where we need to look inward and then look outward, recognizing the situation that's outside. Because I'm happy with Tampa Bay. Yeah, they send me the kind of volume that I need because I have to feed 200 families thereabouts every week, every Tuesday. It just so happens that their program fits mine because they can deliver on a Tuesday. For those who needs delivery on a Wednesday or a Thursday, I know they are having problems. I'm seeing the increase in people coming to my pantry because smaller pantries in the vicinity have had to close or they had to cut back. I need Manatee County Food Bank because they provide services much more than just food. They provide diaper care, infant formula, things like that that are necessary for our pantry to feed or, or minister to our community that Feeding Tampa Bay hasn't incorporated with their program yet. So I need to have them both. From <coughs> the way it looks in my perspective, Manatee County Food Bank could go out of business, or at least that part of their operation, because they are much more than just a food bank. But I like what um, uh, Commissioner Boss said. She wants to meet with both of them. And I'm hoping that in that meeting, they all can look inward 
and realize that the decision that they have made affects much more than the relationship between the two of them. And I don't want to presuppose, but I'm thinking that we can have Manatee County Food Bank continue to serve the needs of the communities that are expressed if there's a relationship between Feeding Tampa Bay and Manatee County Food Bank where some of them can go and get part of their product. I guess my time is up. But um, get part of what they need from Manatee County Food Bank and the rest can come from Feeding Tampa Bay. And Feeding Tampa Bay will still be in charge of the project. They will still manage the contracts for the food distribution within the Manatee County. That seems to be the best solution at this point. It seems like going backward a little bit, but I think it's going forward a great deal if we can do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take your time. <laughs> this is emotional meeting. Yeah. It's like, wow. Uh -huh. We got to come together. Because yes. mm -hmm. I'm telling you, I wear this badge every day and a half for years. And the people in this community see CPS on it. And unfortunately, between the badge that we wear, the stigma that society has, when I take a food basket to a home, these people are so thankful. It changes the whole stigma of CPS for what they think. And for me to walk into a house, and whether it be children there, or I go when they're at school, or they see me, or people ask me what I do, and I distribute a food basket of food, and like I said earlier, it's gone from boxes to bags. It doesn't matter how much it is. These people are grateful for what I bring them. And the stigma that CPS already has, that there's allegations that somebody has put on their family, and we've got to come into their home and disrupt their family and what's going on. And yes, true trust and believe, our numbers will show that this county has some real problems, and it doesn't lie just in food. But since this meeting is about food and getting this worked out, we got to do something as a collaboration, as a state, as the USDA. I'm not quite understanding all that's going on, but what I do know is we got to come together. These big pantries that are talking about they can handle this and these little pantries <coughs> talking about they might have to close down because they don't have this, that, and the third. I go directly to the food bank, and they fill my van. We go Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays to pick up baskets of food and bags of um, the baby supplies. We need this. If nothing else, it bridges the fact of the sheriff's office and law enforcement and the stigma that we have that we're there in their home disrupting them, whether it be we're doing an investigation for allegations that may be verified and they may not be verified. But they're thankful that CPS has brought that to them. And not only did I leave them with a food basket, but I left them with a pantry list that I've also seen go from almost a page and a half of food pantries to a, a, a half a page, three quarters of a page over the years. We need to come together because our families and our communities, our agencies that are helping my agency, that is helping these families in need. We need that gap. We need to breed, bridge that gap because there's a stigma and it's not just any individual or agency's fault and what we come together. 
we're trying to do our best and put both feet forward. We all put our pants on the same way. I need my child, your children, and the children of this community to understand that as a community, we can come together by bridging that gap. Us as adults and politics, it doesn't do anything if we can't come together because we all have a bridge to bring together. The gap has got to come together somehow or another. <coughs> and I don't know what you guys in politics and Tampa Bay and the food bank, we need y'all. We need y'all and we need you. Please come together and help us. Because I can say, I enjoy saying you're very welcome. I'm so glad to. And when these people see me in the community, in my plain clothes, I never know if they know me on a good basis mm -hmm. or they, if they know me on a negative or positive. Of course, I want to hear about the positive, but true trust and belief, we get the negative that comes at us more often than not. Mm -hmm. And if I delivered a food basket to them, I can walk away saying, whew, this is okay. I'm okay. I can go home at the end of the day. And... I know this, I know I started off emotional, but it means a lot to us. Mm -hmm. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much for your service. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Thank you, honey. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A lot of people that care. Oh, if I can say <laughs> just one more thing. <laughs> I also place children. I also place children with relatives, non relatives. Foster parents, there are, somebody said, there are an extremely amount of relatives and non-relatives in this community that are getting children. And access, DCF access, food stamps, there's a belief that if parents were getting food stamps for the children, then the new relatives or the new placement can get those children's food stamps. Mm -hmm. That's not the case. It's based upon their income. Mm -hmm. So you can't go out and just apply for food stamps because you got children placed with you. Can we get a little off the subject here? Income. We got to stay focused on what we're trying to get done. But what I'm but saying is those families also need the food baskets that I'm delivering to I the placements. Thank you. So there's still that need. Yeah. Hi, good evening. I'm Alberta McIntosh and I'm from AM and FM Enterprise. Uh, we're located. Uh, right off of 616 10th Street here in Bradenton. And we are one of those small food pantries that they've been talking about today. And we do, we do see the difference, you know, since the changes have been made. But just like the young lady said, something has to give. We can come together to do something to be able to feed our community. We serve, uh, when we get there on Saturday morning, we usually start serving around 8 o'clock. There are people lined up waiting now they have gotten so that they will bring chairs so that they can be comfortable to sit down, you know, and wait for the food. Not only that, we serve children. We also go out on the fourth, uh, every fourth Saturday of the month, we go out and we serve the community. We cook food and we take it out at that time. But then again, there we, here we go again. It's also been a decrease in what it is that we can and what we cannot do here in Manatee County. I'm a local nurse in the uh, community. I've been in the community. Carol know me for over 30 some years. We're that old. And <laughs> we're that old. <laughs> and the changes that I have seen and I'm seeing now, you know, is impacting Manatee County great. Uh, greatly. And you know, and my prayer is that something can be done, you know, so that the food pantries can continue to circle. There are a lot of hungry people out there. You know, for people that have not actually been out there to actually see, I mean, actually see with your own eyes, you know, what the need is that's out there, you would actually be surprised. And the children that we meet when we go out on the fourth Saturday, it breaks your heart, you know, when you come and we have, we have served the last food and there is no child, there is a child coming up and we don't have anything further to give them as well as when they come to our facility. So my plea is today that we can be able to come together to do something. Manatee County, I mean, Manatee County, we need the food here. 
you know, I don't know why something, you know, that's not broken is trying to be fixed, but, you know, Manatee County has served uh, well here in Manatee County, on the inside of Manatee County, uh, not taking anything from feeding Tampa Bay. Uh, you know, I mean, we're going to do what we need to do in order to continue to feed our people because that's what my heart is. My heart is in feeding the people. When this vision was given to us to go out and feed people, it was not just given just for us to be able to sit down because someone else come and take the contract. We will make a way. We will make a way for that. But I just want to say, you know, whatever. I don't know what the commissioners can do. I don't. I don't know. You know, I don't know how the government goes in that that portion. But at the same time, if there's anything that you can do, you know, I'm asking that you will do it. Also, we also have a big Thanksgiving feast. I know my time is up, but in November we have a big Thanksgiving feast where we feed the whole entire community, the homeless, the less fortunate, everybody, over at 616 10th Street East. And you come over, you'll see the difference. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you. Is there anybody else from the public that would like to come down and speak? Seeing nobody, will close public comment. We've got some commissioner comments. I'll just start it off by, again, thanking all of you for coming. I know this is, for me personally, been a very educational um, hour, two hours, wherever we've been here now. Um, two and a half. It, and it's, uh, you know, we got two, two, what I see is huge problems. There's one, listening to you all, that your, 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 uh, <coughs> your different facilities are growing exponentially. So that tells me that our, the people that are needy in this town mm -hmm. are growing exponentially. So that's kind of scary um, that we're not doing a good enough job, either us up here or the community, to sit there and get these people educated or get jobs or whatever the case may be. And then the other big problem from what I hear is we, we're getting less and less food from our sources to feed the people. <laughs> so that just compounds the whole problem that we have type of thing. And I, I don't, I'm certainly not smart enough to know the solution to that, but you got two very difficult situations here that we're gonna have to, you know, try to wrestle with over, and the county keeps growing, as we all know. So the problem's not gonna go away. And uh, if, you know, Tom is right, you know, the, your supply of food is gonna continue to decrease as these stores get more and more efficient as to what their, you know, their inventory cost is and moving it off the shelf. Um, but like I say, uh, again, you all are angels for what you do. And, and from my perspective, you know, um, you know, hopefully maybe we can come to some solution and, mm -hmm. you know, try to, you know, work with you all as best we can to facilitate, you know, the different things that are out there. So, um, Commissioner Servia. Yes, thank you. Um, so I appreciate all of you very much, too. And um, the really good news is that it seems that everybody has the same goal. So it's always an easier problem when we're all looking at the same problem and we all understand it. Um, it, it seems to me that um, the food pantries are something that are needed all the time. This is no longer just to, to bridge a gap when someone becomes unemployed or for short-term relief. It seems like I'm see what I saw this morning and what I'm hearing about is long-term need. Um, and I think what we need to do when we leave here today is focus on what we can do. Everybody has talked about things that have happened, but I think we all understand what we can do and we need to be focused in that area. One of the things I'm thinking of is these smaller food banks are being impacted the most because they can't afford the refrigeration and the freezers and the transportation costs. So we could use some centralized hubs where food can come in and be distributed uh, to the smaller food banks from there. That's what I thought. We have. Uh, we have one. No, I understand. No. No, that's I, different. I, I think that's important. And one of the things that Jim Schilling, <laughs> who spoke earlier, the commercial airline pilot, taught me is he said, look, when he's flying across the Atlantic, he has two engines in his plane <laughs> because if one goes down, he's got to have a backup. And he kind of related that to distributing food. It is a little bit frightening when there isn't a backup. 
I think um, Feeding Tampa Bay is doing a great job based on what I've seen. I saw the food that went out today. It looked good. It looked healthy. It was helping people. But what happens if there's an accident and, and we can't get the food? Or what happens if you change the day of distribution? What happens if the engine goes down? We, yeah. we do need to all work together and have some other opportunities that maybe come through feeding Tampa Bay. I don't know. Um, and then I, I'm also reminded up here, I'm thinking about what the county commission can do. And although we don't have any power in this particular case, I think that we can encourage and incentivize community gardens. I think we need to look at urban um, agricultural ordinances. I think that we need to start doing things too to help bridge the gap for the food shortage. So I just hope that everyone leaves here today with an open mind to work together to help feed the people who need it. Thank you. Commissioner Whitmore. And um, I would like if Tom would come up because I, I just have a few questions to ask. And first of all, I want, I, as he's coming up, I want to tell Miss Shirley and Miss McIntosh, I would never call you by your first name, that uh, I love you both to death. And uh, I was a real young nurse when she was there. So anyway, <laughs> I had to say that. It's not true. We're probably the same age. Um, first of all, what I'm hearing, um, I really think that there, and you have done it in other places. So the Child Protective Services issue is mainly, it's a public <coughs> safety issue more than a food issue. Yep. So, and, I'll do, and I know you will, uh, I would ask that you, when you leave here, that you talk to the citizen that came up and get her people to talk to and see how you can help. And I know you don't do small things, but you've done it other places, so I would ask that you do that. Also, um, the 25 food agencies. What I'm hearing today are their smaller ones. And this is what I was thinking, and it, and it kind of got booed in the audience, but um, the uh, food bank has freezer space. And if these individual agencies signed up with you individually for their agencies, could they not um, rent or whatever from food bank areas at, that could be delivered there for the smaller food banks? And I'm not going to micromanage. This is an idea that I would like you to look at if you've done other, anything else creatively like that. Because if somebody gets like five pallets of asparagus and they only need like a half a pallet, you know, so, but you would have a contract with them and they would still pay your delivery fee. Um, the store, uh, the stores um, that right now, there's no choice, guys. The grocery stores and everybody's giving their food to Feeding Tampa Bay, correct? Okay. Uh, I remember um, being, when I was involved with the food bank, they were charging 18 cents a pound. And, and somebody said 19, but at one point it was 18, but that was a few years ago. So they were charging also, and you're charging um, your fee for delivery, but you're not charging two fees. You're just a delivery fee because you're not allowed to charge for that. Okay. Um, from what I understood when I met with you, that when you pick up the food, it stays in the county. You don't drive it to Tampa unless you have to. You have five trucks? How many trucks uh, in town? We're time? operating three most three. days. Okay, you have three mm -hmm. trucks that pick up, and then they deliver to your... 25 agencies, correct? And if you can't get them all delivered, you go up to Tampa and then you come back the next day because you have so many hours, correct? Okay. Um, I'm still thinking about the personal storage space. Um, Vanessa mentioned the farms. I remember the O'Brien farms. Tommy O'Brien called me and said, I got some cabbage and took them to um, Turning Points. Uh, and, and we distributed, the food bank distributed 60,000 pounds of cabbage um, to 18 agencies. So that's not going to go away. I mean, unless I know that it takes them $900,000 a year to run the food pantry. So they're going to have to figure out ways to eat, to be able to still do that because you're not you're not going to change and we know that it it sounds like. But what <coughs> I think there's a way. Here's what I the impression I've gotten. I've met with Bambi and I've met with Mary Beth and I've met with you and it's been hell both meetings. It's, it's, you guys are at each other's throats and it's not helping. It's not helping. Um, Susie Bowie's back there. There's a big need I know for, and I give my campaign monies always to baby food and diapers. Uh, and I give it to the food bank. Um, and I give it to turning points too. Uh, do you deliver baby food 
to your um, food bank. So when it's donated, there was mention of formula, diapers, et cetera, Tires, before, right? Well, right. it depends. We source from CVS and Walgreens as well for those items. Okay. But again, just as you can imagine, laundry soap, diapers, things of that nature, baby formula are very hard to come by. Right. Uh, we do buy some of those items in mass quantity when we can, but they're difficult to get donated. And what about animal food? So we actually do pet food because we know a fair amount of seniors need pet food, so we do collect that uh, and distribute that as well. Okay. The big thing I'm seeing here is, and I don't think we should be involved. I think you guys are adults. We've had this meeting today. We've heard, you've heard from the community. You've heard from us. We still want to support you. They are going to continue doing their model. So you need to get together with the community as a whole. You need to meet. You guys need to meet. I mean, it, it's been really um, upsetting on um, the way that both villainized each other, and I, I don't want to deal with that. That's not my style. It's just, it's, it, you guys got to help the people out here in the audience. Right. And what I'm thinking, um, I don't know in your business model if you've ever done this. You're hearing from a lot of these people that feed a lot of people. Is there any way that have you, would you consider or look at these people leasing from a large freezer space Signing up with you, paying your fee, and being able to pick their food up at one central location. I know you have 25, but there are small agencies that just can't do that. I know it may not be in your business model. I'm just asking. So uh, I would say as a general statement to everybody here and to the commission, we're willing to continue to make sure that our model meets the needs of any community we're in, in this instance, to the citizens of Manatee County. Uh, we're dedicated to that. We have been. Change is difficult for everybody. We heard loud and clear some folks who are struggling with change today, and we heard some folks that are doing well with change. Right. Certainly the predominant amount are struggling with the change. We heard that loud and clear. We'll continue to look at what the best way to support the community is, and we're happy to do that. Uh, what that may mean in a specific instance, I don't have an answer to it. So for some of our partners, and I think a few of them mentioned this, we've put 25 or 30 freezers and coolers into different agencies down here that we got funding for. So there are ways that we're trying to meet that need, and we'll continue to do that. I would, again, encourage any agency here that's not currently in relationship with us that we would love to have a conversation about how we can best support you. Okay. Uh, and, and, you know, we, uh, just like we've done before, there's times we get it right and there's times we need to fix it. There are times <laughs> that we can improve and we're happy to do that. It's never a good idea for someone to have a pallet full of X. No. Right? We understand that. That means we're not doing a good job distributing. And we're happy to continue that process of understanding how best to serve the community. And we'll keep an open mind about that as requested. Uh, so I hope that's a yeah. uh, thoughtful enough statement that says we're willing to have conversations with the uh, partners in the community. I hope also that it's just very hard for us to say in each specific instance how we might respond to a particular challenge. And I Every part of the county is different. Mm -hmm. Every agency has differences when they serve, how they serve, where they serve. And one of the points I'd make to everybody, and this has been said over and over again, and we feel very strongly about this. We start from the individual in need and work our way backward from there. So whoever the partner is, whatever the opportunity is, whatever the distribution methodology is, we start with the person and we work alongside partners uh, to get that food into the community and really ultimately into the home of the individual who's in need. <coughs> We're committed to that and will remain so committed. Okay, and I would ask everybody that's here today, if you have questions or concerns that you should go, when we're done with this meeting, go out and talk to Feeding Tampa Bay, see if it fits your organization, because I've heard some people said they just weren't going to do it until, you know, they just wanted to see if there's anything we could do, which there isn't. And then I would please ask that you two hopefully work it out. And I would ask Susie Bowie, I'm more worried about the kids with the baby formula and stuff. And I have a feeling that that's getting lost. So I don't know what to do if there's some donors out there in this world uh, I know many homeless uh, mothers that I've heard throughout the years they dilute their baby formula because they can't afford it. It's $33 a, 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 a can. Mm -hmm. And if you make 9 bucks an hour, what do you think you're going to do? You're going to dilute it. So I would ask our community to step up that. I would ask our community to step up with our food banks. I know you still have your drives. We're going to continue doing that. There is going to be a shortfall in other things, and we as a community need to step up. But you two need to work out to help all these people. And so I would ask every, you guys to meet with our citizens after we're done, and maybe you'll get some more people uh, look into your program, and then other, and I, please all meet. That's all I ask. That's, that's all.
Commissioner Benack. Wants to, know, wants to know if he can sit down again. Yeah, you can sit down again. <laughs> can he sit down? <laughs> he went like that. Oh, I did he go? I assume oh. that's what he was asking. Um, yeah, I've gotten emotional here. I've never seen a meeting like this. I've been here almost eight years, and I don't think I've ever seen a meeting like this. You know, And I can't help it, and, and Commissioner Whitmer's probably going to jump down my throat. We have people in here crying about dogs constantly. Oh, boy, you've but done I it But I have now. not seen people come in here crying about people <laughs> until today. It's nice for a It's change. unbelievable to me. I'm so thankful for all of you that work so hard in this field. And the, the young lady, boy, you really got me from Child Protection Services. I cannot even imagine what your job is like. We know that that's a big issue in this community, all the kids that are taking it out of their home. Maybe it's because I took care of my grandbaby this morning that I'm so <laughs> emotional to hear this discussion. But I also know I, I go to Manatee United Methodist Church. Our church is turning 170 years old in this community. And I joke about how... The average age is half of that in our church. The reality is churches, and we had quite a sermon on this this past week, and I don't want to cry, but churches are going away. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's wrong. <laughs> I, it's just, <laughs> I look at her because she cries a lot, Gen too. Gen X is bringing them back. <laughs> Gen X is um, bringing them back. Because you guys are doing yeoman's work. You are doing the work of feeding this community. And I've never heard from so many churches. I guess you don't, you don't, you know that whole church and state thing? You guys are doing a good job doing what you have to do. But I think that was so, was so important for our community and for all of us to understand the need that's going on. And you guys have brought it forward. But you can't when the average age of folks 68 years old, yeah, you're, you're a youngin in the church, and I get that. And it's so difficult. And so we have defined a problem today. I don't know how much... We've made toward um, solving that problem, but we have defined a major problem, and we know that we have some resources. Feeding Tampa Bay, I met with them. You know, they, they don't have to do this. I was, I was suspicious. You know what? Well, you get all the money if you take us over. I didn't know what it was about either. So they're this big umbrella organization, and they have these, you know, they're doing what they can do with their model. But we've had this incredible model here, and now the resources are shifting. So I'm going to say something to the community of Manatee County. We need to fill in this gap. Right. We need to fill this gap in. We're going to have Feeding Tampa Bay, and we're going to have mm -hmm. our own food bank. Mm -hmm. But we need a lot more resources um, to, to get this done, I do believe. And I don't think, I don't think the average citizen in Manatee County understands what y'all are doing. I know I didn't. I didn't, I didn't you know, either. I, I, I don't think any of us up here knew. I so um, I think it's very important. You know, we've been talking a lot about homelessness here. You know, these things go hand in hand. You know, reading, the whole reading thing. We've been so engaged in that. We've been putting resources to that. But I know at our church we do pack a sack. I guess I'd never heard that pack a sack I isn't working because we do it. I mean, I, I give money to support our pack a sack program at our church. We're paired up with Manatee Elementary so that we can make sure that those kids have something to eat on the weekend. But, you know, if all it is is feeding for one night, Friday night, I, I didn't even think about that. Me so I, I hope there's a coalition that is, a, is getting together to have a list of where these food banks are. I don't know if you all have such a thing, a coalition that works together. I'm so actually, can, I, can I just interrupt one thing? I'm trying to put association of food pantries together. In fact, I'm, that's... I think so. I mean, I, I think we can do that. You know, I hate to, you know, I wasn't going to volunteer anything from our county, but maybe we, we do have a great Folks neighbor of services. Did. Maybe they could help put together a list, at least. Ava, Ava's right oh, there. there. She's there going she like is. this. Right <laughs> She'll do it. That's my wave. Queen. Um, they could perhaps put together a list of all of these food services, and maybe we could get working together. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's going to be helpful. Um, but I, I hope um, with Susie Bowie sitting here, I know I sit, I'm the vice president of the uh, Kiwanis Foundation. I mean, it, it, there's just so many things that I just don't think people understand, and we need to focus on this better. We can't have this situation in our county. It just doesn't make any sense. So, an opportunity. Thank you. It is an opportunity.
Right. That's right. I agree with you. And I'm going to say this out loud because you're not on camera or not at the and not and not being um, heard. But what you're saying is this is an opportunity for the folks that are working so hard trying to make this work with these partners that do get get funding from various agencies, state agencies, there is tax dollars going into, I would believe, both agencies at some level with grants, whether it be through senior housing, it whether it be from, I don't know who exactly, at, you, know, you know, maybe I'm making this up, but um, that there is uh, grant money that is available sometimes for feeding homeless people. USDA, that's a great, you know, USDA is a um, United States organization, right? So there's tax dollars going to that. So um, I think it's important that we make sure we understand what resources are available and work the best we can with our partners to make sure those resources are being distributed in the best way possible. And that's a commitment that I'll make to try to work on that. That's about all I can say from today. But thank you, everybody, for being here and sharing. Commissioner Ball. Yeah, I've just got a couple of questions. And I think your name is Tom. Yes. So could you come back up to the podium, please? <laughs> <clears throat> I'm sorry. I must be the only commissioner that I did not meet with him. I met with him. I didn't think there was a need. Um, Tom, I'm going to ask that you still, I want a meeting set up between you and Mary Beth Phillips because you made, so you were close to, it was very negative, and I want to find out what's going on. So I want a meeting with the two of you together so we can try to come with a solution. We'll consider that. <laughs> Well, that's a real step in the right direction, Tom. Thank you. Well, at least I can see you're, you're genuine. To. Okay. Yeah. Well, Oversight. let's carry it a little further then. Do you make money? Does Tampa Bay, feeding Tampa Bay make money off of Manatee County? No. We expend resource here. We spend more in this county. So you make money off of some of the food banks. They pay you for... The food right. that you if deliver, that accounts but for, if that accounts for even ten, small. right? If that accounts for even ten percent of what it costs us to do that, I'd be surprised. Most of our funding that we exercise here in Manatee County comes from donations from outside of Manatee County. Okay, all right. I didn't. Somebody had made a comment about it, so I wasn't sure. That's why I was asking. No disrespect again. I was just. I didn't know. Um, when does the contract that you have for Manatee County expire? What contract are you referring to? I'm assuming that you have a contract to handle Manatee County? Uh, so if you're referring to the Feeding America contract. Whatever you call it, right. I don't know So that renews, I think, every four years or something like that. Um, but it usually is a year-over-year -year automatic renewal. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, so it's not as if, um, I guess it's not as if, um, I think you're asking is there a way to get to the end of that contract and negotiate a county uh, conversation about what counties we're responsible for. That's not usually negotiated in the contract, so to speak. The contract's really more about services. Well, the reason I ask, again, um, the, the reason I'm asking is because I think it's very clear that, you know, I think there were two that felt very positive about what they're, what they're getting right now, but the other majority were not. And so what I'd love to see, and it worries me a little bit with you not, that you'll only consider my request is that it seems to me that you're hearing from the, the residents that are here, they really do need our food bank to, to be able to go to to get the things that they need mm -hmm. uh, over and above what they seem to be getting from you. Mm -hmm. So that being said, I was hoping that perhaps my next question was going to be in the meeting between the two of you. I was hoping that perhaps we could find a solution where the two of you could work together and you could supply some of these needs at our food bank here in Manatee County for some of the others to use. But right, am so, I to assume that's not a possibility? So to you answer your question in two ways, Commissioner, I think first, irrespective of Food Bank of Manatee, there are a lot of great agencies in this community, and we're happy to sit down with them and discuss particularly what their needs are. More than happy to do that. And so if there's an agency here today that wants to talk to us about how we can support them, we're happy to have that conversation. And secondarily, if there's an agency we're supporting that our need, we're not meeting their needs, we're happy to have that conversation as well. So I want to be abundantly clear to everybody. We're very, very happy to have those conversations. If Food Bank of Manatee and Feeding Tampa Bay want to get together and have a conversation, then I think that's a conversation that the two of us should have. 
I don't necessarily feel like it should be brokered by the commission. I think that our two organizations ought to have a conversation about whether that should take place. Have you tried to do that, the two of you? Um, I would say no, not at this juncture. So uh, my rejection or my concern about doing that with someone brokering, and I think if uh, mm -hmm. Food Bank of Manatee wants to have that conversation, we'd be happy to have a conversation with them. Whether we're both ready to do that, I don't know that. I also want to address something else from our perspective. The relationship ended with Food Bank of Manatee, and what we said to the commissioners that we met with 15 months ago was we were going to come in and do our job and work hard. We have stayed out of public comment wherever possible. Yeah. We have tried to keep our comments private wherever possible, and we've tried to remain civil publicly wherever possible. We've tried to make sure that we feed folks in the community without getting involved in public rancor. So again, if Food Bank of Manatee and Feeding Tampa Bay want to have a conversation, I'm open to that. Commissioner, I'm happy to sit down with you. I had a meeting on your books. Uh, for whatever That's reason, right, it got I canceled. canceled it. Right. right. So I'm happy to sit down engagement. with you and have. Yes, happy to have a conversation with you. I was able to meet with all of your colleagues. Good. And as Mary Beth uh, and Bambi walk away from this conversation and they want to have a consideration for a con future conversation, Please. I'll bring that back to my board and have that conversation as well. And then I trust that the two of our organizations can talk uh, about that. And that being said, let me say, <clears throat> I don't really care whether the two of y'all get together or not. What I do care about are the citizens in this room that have said they need that food bank to help them. Mm -hmm. So that is my concern. It doesn't matter to me whether the two of y'all need to meet. I don't care. But I would like to see their concerns taken care of and their needs met, and they're not being met. So however or whatever it takes for you and your board to figure out how to do that and give that to these citizens that are here before us, I'd really appreciate it. Because you know what? I don't want to be involved in your business. I don't want to be involved and have to broker a meeting between the two of you. But it seems to me that so far, it doesn't seem to be working. Right. So whatever you can do, that is my only goal. Right. Take care of the people in this room that are not getting the supplies they need to get. It is easy to do. I, I, <laughs> the food bank here has been here longer than you. They know the people. They know the needs. They have made sure that it's been met in years before. So that I would think, from your standpoint, they would be a good advantage for you and perhaps make your job with your organization a little easier. That's all I'm saying. Right. Well, Commissioner, on this we agree. We're happy to and want to continue to improve service in Manatee County for the community here. Well, I uh, think you've heard from them and you know what it's going to take. Absolutely. Please. And we're happy to continue to have those conversations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Bellamy. Wow. I know. I know. What I want is talk about action steps real quick. Um, some some things that I um, I want to see can we do from our community standpoint. There's identify that list of um, organizations as far as um, food banks and food pantries, and how we can communicate amongst each other. And I know that that's not necessarily our responsibility from here, but I'm putting that information out. Um, sir, if we can find a way to communicate, if I can communicate with you, I do want to have a role and be a part of it so I could just be in the know, um, not to try to um, guide or dictate what should or should not be done, just so I can make sure my constituents are informed. But as far as the um, action steps, making sure we identify ways to communicate amongst each other, um, because if you do have that excess, and there's a phone call or there's a way <laughs> that you can oh, excuse me that you can bridge that gap where someone who de who has a need and the access can support the need we can find a way to make that communication take place um, I think that's the direction from the count from Manatee County we need to um, we need to go in um, and within those collaborating our um, options I've learned and I'm and, and I'm, I'm pretty positive and um, um, this is just me to feeding Tampa Bay, um, and it's nothing against nobody else. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you for, for, for your time and your con, con, consistent statement mm -hmm. of saying we are willing to work with anybody. Now, to our constituents, from, from me to you, is we have to take that challenge up and find out how that looks. We have to take and, and, and communicate what the needs are, what the issues are, not talking about it. We have to have it documented so we can make the check mark saying that we're making progress. And again, the need for the individuals in our community are definitely being impacted and we're serving like we want to do. So I'm looking for action steps and I'm not going to go back and forth. It's just not my nature 
or my, my, but I do want to make sure that that communication amongst um, entities are there internal. I'm talking about the ones in Manatee County. So if there's a, um, a need, we can find a way to, to, to help bridge that gap. And then obviously if there's a way we can extend that challenge um, to feeding tamper rate to support um, some of those collaborating efforts, we need to look at that also. Um, so that's where I am. Okay. Commissioner Trace. Uh, yeah, Tom, I just want to say thank you. I've had two nice conversations mm -hmm. with you. You've been nothing but a gentleman. Yeah, twice. Um, but I really hate to say it. I don't think his business model works for the small mm -hmm. pantries right. in our community. Right. So you go do your thing. I'm fine with that. You're, my two cans and I'm buying at Publix. I no longer will buy at Publix. I will buy them and bring them here and put them in the yellow bin that's right out front. I think as commissioners, we need to figure out a way to get these bins somewhere that people do it. I don't know. I mean, uh, Little League, maybe opening day of Little League. Mm -hmm. you, Everywhere. I, I don't know. Any, you know, we can we can find out ways. Feeding Tampa Bay is going to do their thing. We need to figure a way to get the yellow bins out there so that we keep our food bank open, regardless of what Feeding Tampa Bay does. Number one, Feeding Tampa Bay is going to do their thing with the larger ones. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. But these smaller people, and once again, that, that takes care of the airline pilot guy too. He will have a second one. Right. In case Tom back there gets messed up down the road. I'm a farmer. I have two ways to water. I have a fast way and an efficient way. And then if that pump goes down, I have a slow and inefficient way. But by golly, I can get my plants watered because it's either that or death. I'm not waiting for somebody <laughs> else. So to me as a commission, we need to figure out, Ava, Neighborhood Services, how to get those yellow bins filled because I know that I'm going to, when I buy my two cans, they're staying in Tampa Bay and they might be helping you, but I want to make sure they're getting to the food bank. I don't know if we can talk to some of these other local people. I don't know. I don't know, but we're smart enough to be able to figure out a way to motivate people to throw cans into a yellow bin. I think we are. Yeah. Maybe on the blood, I don't know. I mean, you know, do. Yeah. blood bank, uh, you know, Everywhere. the blood mobile. Uh, you know, somehow maybe you're a little uh, on a little league opening day. You get a dollar. You you know get a uh, hot dog if you bring a can. I know every time they go to the Rays game, if I get I get a dollar for a coke or something. If I bring a couple cans, I don't know. We should be able to figure something out. That's all I have to say. I just have one closing. Tom, how long has this agreement been going with you as far as taking over the uh, yes, food on. bank here? <laughs> Yep. You might as well just you stay here. Up front. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it gives you time to think of the answer. So I'm going to answer the question more fully because I think it's helpful to know. We've always had responsibility for 35 years for Manatee County. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so in our viewpoint, we work through a partnership locally. And so the food that came into the community, the resources that came from food, all of that, we were responsible for partnering that. So we've been here for 35 years. To answer your question specifically, uh, the contract changed in June of 2018. Do I have that right? July 1st of 2018. So about a year. Right. Uh, about 15 months, yes, sir. 15 months, okay. No, just curious. Cause I and think then the USDA thing went away more recently, right? That's October 1st of this year, yes. What, what so, we're still, so we're still... I would say kind of on the honeymoon stage. I would say, again, if we could ask folks leave if we, as we talk about this, there have been adjustments to our model along the way. Yeah. You know, one of the things I'd like the commissioners and folks to understand as we think about this, food relief has to become more mobile and more quick, and we understand why folks want refrigerators and shelves and all of that. But one of the things we've done, which folks have mentioned is problematic, but we saw as a good thing, is we delivered everybody. Right, we overcome the barrier of I can't get to the food bank, I can't drive, those kinds of things. So part of our model is about delivering too and changing some of those barriers. We obviously need to make some course corrections along the way, but again, I want to emphasize we're willing and happy to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, seeing no nobody else, we will um, close this section of the uh, work section. So thank you all again for coming. and. Please keep doing what you're doing. And Thank you all for your We'll time. help as best we can. We have something else on the agenda? Yes. Yep. This is going to be another like three, three minute break? This is about paying him. Are we home. done? Are you taking a break? No, no we got one more. Got Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing I'm this. Leaving. Happy birthday. <laughs>
a 10, but it's been 10 now anyway. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you. We're going to um, reconvene if everyone's ready for the second part of our work session today, which is on so social service programs impacted by homelessness and pedestrian safety. Thank you. We're going to turn it over to Ava Edie, our Neighborhood Services Director, and this is a continuation of the discussion we had on the uh, 24th. And Ava? Good afternoon, County Commissioners, County Administrator, and County Attorney Palmer. Ava Eady, Neighborhood Services Department. And I wanted to run through quickly um, a lot of the information we gave you earlier on the 24th of September. Um, I just wanted to do a little recap of that and talk because we were very fortunate today to be sh um, joined by some of our local agencies and some of the people who also work in this area. So um, I see Turning Points here. Um, I also see United Way and Center Stone and Sheriff Wells um, and, pardon? Hope. Hope. Exactly. So um, some of those agencies that serve in that area. So I'm hoping they will also be able to join in this discussion with us. So when we began to talk about homelessness and the issues, we realized that there's often a lot of needs and it's very hard for us to determine what it is that's occurring with each individual. And each individual has a very, very unique story to tell. Often there are co-occurring issues and that we saw a lot of these um, issues uh, commonly with our folks. And um, for instance, the people that are um, have lost a home, they have one incident of health issue and it ends up taking them down. So they lose their place to live, um, they begin to have food insecurity and they also quite often have maybe a substance abuse issue or a mental health issue. And so what we're seeing is that some of our folks that are out on the streets are really struggling and they can't find a way to get back up. They don't necessarily trust people. We found from even our veterans, <coughs> some of them don't want to be indoors. And you know, this idea of, of one size fits all isn't necessarily working for them. So a 40 hour uh, work week, five days a week, isn't necessarily something they can manage. So sometimes it's a matter of looking at how do we help them in a different way. We can't buttonhole each of them and insist that they're going to fit our mold. We're going to have to figure out different solutions for each of them. And that uniqueness is really what's going to lead the way we deal with them. So we looked at our own area and uh, determined that for uh, a lot of these folks, we have a lot of services through neighborhood services which are commonly available uh, to them if they're aware of it, if they find their way to us. And so we are looking for new ways to reach out. So our aging and eligibility services, which is led by Tracy Adams, does everything we can to keep our seniors at home, if that means a little help with their heat or with their um, light housekeeping or to provide a meal and then our children's services, we fund all the not-for-profit contracts for our children's programs in the community, and that is led by Susan Ford. Our adult services is currently led by Renice Remy, and that handles all the not-for-profit contracts to a lot of the agencies out there, such as Say La Freedom. And then our veteran services, led by Lee Washington. Our library is led by Glenda Lammers, and as you have mentioned, a lot of our community spends a good part of their day in some of our libraries. And our probation, pretrial release, and offender work program is led by Jennifer Berg, and she and her team work to get some pretrial release for some of our folks to try and keep them out of jail, because at $87 a day, it's really not cost effective, and that doesn't include the medical issues. Our health care area is led by Joshua Barnett, and he's working diligently to help serve the community that has no insurance. And our neighborhood connections team, Deb DeLeon and her team, reach out to the community and serve them 
at the point of need, trying to determine what their needs are to help move their community forward. And then our criminal justice liaison is Renice Remy. She works with the Public Safety Coordinating Council and Commissioner Bellamy to help move some of those issues forward. Our local resources, we have a number of shelters locally, um, and they don't all look the same. What we have found that there are a number of different styles of shelters, and for each of them, it is a different way of housing. Sometimes it's a supporting housing, uh, shared housing. Maybe it's an alcohol or drug rehab, a rooming house or a boarding house. And I think um, one of our ready examples is our Hope Family Services, which is our domestic violence shelter. And we do have representation here today from that area. We also have our turning points, or CCH, and that is not necessarily shelter housing. It's actually all the other needed supports. That's where they're getting a 2,000 calorie meal, and they are able to get a shower and have their clothes laundered, hopefully get some medical and dental services if that's a need for them, get an address, and hopefully keep them from losing any housing they have by giving them some temporary support. We also have a good number of faith-based institutions, as I'm sure you can recall now just from our discussion with our food banks. They're a very strong group. We have a lot of them out there. Some of them are very small and some of them are very large, such as Jewish Family Services or Catholic Charities. And they will provide housing assistance, utility support, food and services to elderly and the special needs community. So what we tried to look at is between what Neighborhood Services is doing and what our community is doing or the funding we're providing to our community to support some of them, um, there's still a lot of gaps, and so we took a look at the outside world to see what was happening and find out if they had any solutions. And what we saw were some really strong initiatives. The first was a day work initiative, and we uh, looked at a number of them, and in fact, um, the one that you'll see there, the Higher Portland Opportunity Crew, they even um, hire out to local businesses for, uh, I think, $1,300 per week, and then that money goes back into the program, and they do any kind of work that comes up. It could be to clean a, uh, a road area or a park or a beach and pick up all the debris uh, or to take care of the yard maintenance. Sometimes it's to paint a mural downtown. I thought those were kind of fun examples, um, and that's more of a lottery system for people. Um, some of them are to go out and uh, just paint the buildings or to pressure wash things. So there's a lot of initiatives out there, and it made me think at the food banks today how many of those groups talked about they needed help to unload the food. Right. That was a really great ready example for me. And hopefully this is loud enough, but this is what's happening currently in one town, and that's yeah, Albuquerque. That's right. Okay. My name is William Cole. Uh, I do security, and I'm the van driver for Betaway Program for St. Martin's. <laughs> Making our first stop here to pick up uh, some of our hopeful employees. How you guys doing today? This was actually the mayor's idea. And he reached out to us with this idea of what would happen if we sent a van around to people who are panhandling and gave them an opportunity to work for a day, be paid for a day, and get support services. How you doing this morning? My name is Will, and we do the Better Way program. What we do is we offer $9 an hour for a day's work and we pay you cash at the end of the day, would you be interested? Well, I thought it was the city coming to tell me I needed to get off the highway first. <laughs> I had a three-bedroom house, I had my kids, I had everything in the world going for me, and um, I had anxiety, and I just started pulling my hair out, and I knew I was gonna lose everything, and I did. All right, let's get it going. How are you today? Everything's good? How are you, ma'am? 
often we talk about employment, we use one model. It's called full-time employment, 40 hour a week, it fits everybody, and it doesn't. If you're dealing with mental health issues, often working one or three days a week is all you can do. All right, we need a couple of shovels, a couple of heavy rakes. We give them an opportunity to work five and a half hours a day for $9 an hour cash. We get rid of at least one to two tons of weeds and litter at each spot, and we offer them services afterwards. I'm not the type of person that really likes to ask people for money. I'd rather earn it. All I need is that one shot, and I'm not going to mess it up. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I go around cleaning up anyways just for free because it's like the world's a dirty place, and so I like cleaning up. I miss cleaning my house, so I don't have a house to clean anymore. This particular program has lots of small, instantaneous goals of getting people off a street corner. And I know that the mayor would echo this. Nobody survives well panhandling on a street corner. In a lot of the neighborhoods, we get people that come out and they really appreciate the beautification work that we're doing in their neighborhoods. Overall, I think this is a better way for people to get money into their pockets other than panhandling. Something happens when you get cash in your pocket. You feel a little taller, you feel a little bigger, you feel a little bit more in control of your life. It's kind of a small miracle. What we're saying to folks is there's a better way. There's a better way than standing on a street corner asking for money. There's a better way than handing $5 out of your window. The better way is to give people the dignity of work, let them beautify their city, and get them connected to services so they can get back on their feet. It's just simple enough, it's working. And again, I wanted to thank Glenn Jablina. He brought us that original video, um, and this was a secondary one. This is where they've gotten to since then. And um, it, was, it was great to see that there were results for a county that's working in a results-based environment. Uh, this brings some excellent results that we can actually take a look at and demonstrate to people that this is the kind of small pilot that could work. and. Um, yield some change to that community. So as you see, uh, 6,666 jobs since 2015, and out of that, 76 of them have uh, actually obtained permanent employment. A lot of these kinds of things are really what's going to make a change in somebody's life. The idea that these day workers are coming together, they're getting a meal, they're getting the transportation, and they're going to work, they're getting a little dignity, some cash in their pocket, they're building a relationship, and at the end of the day, they're getting connected to the services they need, and hopefully with a longer term relationship with some of these agencies. Again, it's very hard for many of these people in our community to trust. And just walking up and talking to them, you may or may not get any response. It's going to take a little while. You have to build something. And now these are the kind of things where you're going to build some further long-term results. The other initiative, and again, this is a short video, and this is about hot teams. Hi, I'm Officer Chris Williams with the Homeless Outreach Team. The state was second in Emporia doing a campsite cleanup. We gotta, let's, let's focus on getting your stuff cleaned up and minimized so we can get you over to your son's house, okay? Our main goal out there is for re to, uh, to get them to the resources they need to actually convince them to be in a sustainable living environment. We have a lot of business owners that complain about the homeless being just standing around, possibly drinking, using drugs. Oh. We need to address uh, help addressing mental health. We need help with uh, situational homelessness. We need places to help step up and provide offer that assistance. There's nothing wrong with donating. They want to donate to shelters or organizations where they can go get these clothes because this is what happens to the clothes you donate them. It also prevents them, pre prevents people in a homeless situation from getting to the right locations because they would feel that, they feel that everything is out here for them. There's a need that we need places for shelter. We need places, we need resources, we need donations to organizations to help fund and get people off the street. Thanks for watching. This is Officer Chris Williams with the Homeless Outreach Team.
We had some information from Tampa Hillsboro. Um, they had reached out and spoke to a couple of us about what they're doing with their hot teams. And then um, recently when we presented, uh, Captain Stiff from <coughs> Sarasota hot team was here. And they talked um, how Sarasota Department created a transit liaison position and added a mental health specialist to work with that transient population in 2014. Today, the hot team there includes a sergeant, four officers, and two civilian case managers, and the team focuses on outreach to educate, encourage, and eventually to enforce when the first two actions fail. Hi. And this is the final initiative that we brought to you, and it is to work towards a hand up rather than a hand out campaign. That could look like a text-based campaign. Um, we could consider putting out, for instance, signs near where the community are giving to the homeless that give them an opportunity to recognize if they gave the money directly to the organization that vets the programs, that there could be some effective change. Uh, I talked to our um, property management folks and Charlie Bishop and the parking garage is not going to be using those parking meters and the city doesn't necessarily want to keep all of them. Um, I thought maybe we could send them to the Village of the Arts and let the organizations themselves do the collecting of what that money is that comes in. It would keep the government out of it, but it would certainly put the money directly into the organization's hands. Um, Vishal Kakad is here and he, he can tell us a little bit more about signs if that's something we chose to do. Uh, it would have to be something we'd have to do as a concerted effort that would educate and create awareness within our community for those people who commonly give. It, it is something when you're sitting at a light, as you all know, you feel the need to give and you want to help people, but there's so much questions about, you know, what is this doing long term? Is it making any real change? And I think with a, an awareness campaign to help people to be aware of what's even available, as well as to give to them directly versus to give to someone, again, that maybe they have concerns about where that money goes eventually, um, it would help them. Um, I, one of the campaigns I really liked uh, was talking about how you can give a bed to the shelter and you literally give someone <coughs> a place to sleep at night. Um, that's a lovely thought. If you think about it, how often those beds at our shelters are used, you have to imagine there's probably a, a, a real need for those kind of things. So just like we heard about the food today, um, we have to look at some of the other areas too. So there are opportunities for us to look at campaigns as well. So what I wanted to do was talk to you and find out a little bit more, where would you like us to go from here? What, what would you like to see us do as our next steps? We have some of the agencies in the community here that can help answer some of those questions. Um, we do fund a lot of our not-for-profits in the community. Um, we do a lot with turning points, but uh, center stone, we give smaller amounts to Salvation Army, but there aren't that many beds there. You know, again, I, I think really what we're looking for is some direction from each of you to help us to move forward. And I know Commissioner Bellamy, you asked for some numbers, and so I put together a day work program and what that could look like. And I'm going to share these with you. And the day work program was to hire a coordinator, 12 day laborers. So that would be the coordinator would go out, it would be a vehicle, they would go out with a 12 passenger van and they would pick up homeless and put them to work at the Alice rate of $12 an hour. It would give them a meal at lunchtime, it would give them a refreshment and it would give them some money in their pocket, some dignity, and at the end of the day, connect them to services. Can we legally do this? Can we legally do this? Yeah. 
Yeah, you give it through an agency. Yeah, that's what I want. That's what we. That's, okay. Yeah, we said that last time. Okay, is that it? Sure. All right. I think we have some commissioners that have uh, questions, and then we'll go to our partners that are here if they want to um, give us some more information, and then we may have more questions. That's how it's gone today. Uh, Commissioner Servia. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ava. Great mm -hmm. presentation. And I appreciate all the partners being in the audience so that we can talk together. Um, so what we have learned up here, at least what I've learned, is that the homeless problem is so complex. It's, it's a different reason for many different people. And uh, one of the people that I met this morning when I was helping with the, the distribution of food had been homeless for more than 50 years since he was 12 years old. And I asked him mm. why he was homeless. And he said, because I'm used to it. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want anyone to control me. Mm -hmm. And I said, why do you think people are homeless? And he said, it's almost always because of mental health issues and addiction. And he said, I used to have both. He said, but today I'm clean and sober. I've dealt with my mental health issues and I want to be free. Mm -hmm. And he has a pet pig. Oh, goodness. That was the other reason. They're easy to feed. You well, no there aren't any. a lot of places that will rent to him because with a pet, a pet pig. pig. And True. he has a felony in his background. And he said that that is a big barrier to finding a place to rent, even if you do have money. Or regular employment. Or regular employment. So I'm really excited about the possibility of addressing these issues head on and helping people to do something different. So thank you for that. My question is for our attorney mm -hmm. uh, about liability. And I don't think that we have any based on what I'm understanding because we would partner with someone else who would take on. It would be their program. It would be their program, right? Mm -hmm. I'll fund it. Okay. I so just wanted to give no you an example of what it would look like because Commissioner Bellamy said put some numbers to it. <laughs> mm -hmm, you got to. Well, a simple example is all of the various nonprofits that we uh, – that we. Uh, contract with children's services being an example all of those entities are are contractually required to have sufficient levels of insurance coverage they are contractually required to indemnify this government mm -hmm. uh, for any uh, you know for, for any acts of negligence and so so yeah that's yeah we that's called risk shifting and uh, my office does that quite routinely yeah. on, on behalf <laughs> of the county <laughs> Uh, I really like the education campaign as well. Uh, I think that's so important. And uh, I have found, uh, just with other agencies that I work with, that sometimes people don't want to give you money, but if you tell them, I need a bed, or you tell them specifically what you need, you're more apt to get that donation. So I like that idea, too. Um, and the day work. I, I would like for us to find a partner in the community to do the day work uh you know we don't we don't want people panhandling on the streets we don't want people living in these homeless camps in the woods mm -hmm. we want them to help themselves to live a better life so i'm very excited about it thank you okay. commissioner whitmore I really love the day work program. Um, I would like to do it for the first year and see what our return on investment is. And if it's saving us money at the end, uh, even expanding it more. I, I totally think people get in a rut just like the guy with the pig. Yeah. Can't rent a place because he's got a pig. He's got a felony. So you have to apply for a job and you've got that on end. Then you just get, you know, forget it. So, um, and I told you that um, there are people that, do not, I mean, I like to be homeless. I told you my husband did surgery on somebody and he went back in the woods and came back in a week and got his stitches out at turning points. So it, it is a fact. Um, I, uh, I think this would be good and I think we need to find the right uh, agency to do this. I, for some reason, I just have a feeling that this is going to work. And you get the right person. That guy driving the bus was the right, right person. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I think that that is something that we should look at. And for those of us, for those that think that we're wasting our money mm -hmm. for something like that, uh, again, the return on the investment after the first year on what we spend with social service, getting arrested for panhandling, going to court, not having food, getting sick, ended up in the hospitals. I mean, there's many other things. And most people that are homeless that I've had experience with, 
they don't want to be there. They don't have, they just can't get out of it. Mm -hmm. So um, I would totally love to move forward on this day work pilot program. Um, I, I just want to ask a couple questions and I'll go to everybody else. So um, we have the Community Coalition on Homelessness, okay? Mm -hmm. And presumably they've done extensive research in this issue. I also know because I, uh, you know, there was a study done back when Pat Glass was on the commission about how to solve the homelessness issue. There was a whole study. It was prepared. Um, I don't think we ever went forward with any of the recommendations. I think she um, wrote and it. And I know Sherry probably <laughs> Sherry wrote it with that. Or maybe some of them yeah. did go forward. I just want to make sure that we're not starting at ground zero because there's a lot of work that's been done. Um, and I, no. and perhaps all of that has been <laughs> consulted. But I also know, talking from Adela Rose or working with her at um, mm -hmm. Turning Points, you know, she's always said, we just need a point person. We need a point person for this issue. She's asked me for that for many, many times, saying, you know, it, it's an issue that a lot of people touch. <coughs> Turning Points, they don't house people. Mm -hmm. Salvation Army does on a very short-term basis. We really, when, when I wrote down, what shelter? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know we have um, Salvation Army, but I, I don't oh, they, think we they, have another shelter. I know that Hope Family Services does have some places for people to go on a short-term basis, but I don't think we really have many homeless beds. Um, I don't and, think what uh, we had was the, what the gentleman, the, um, the faith-based gentleman in that video. We don't have him here, right. you know what I mean, doing that thing right. in, in a full-blown. We have pieces and parts. You're right. So, I, I mean, I, I, it's not that I don't, I, I like the day work pilot program, but it seems to me that maybe people, I mean, you know that guy that offered, you, we all read about him in the Brighton Herald, right? So it makes me question whether or not it's true. But they, that he did ask whether or not, you know, he, he tried to give money to somebody and said, um, you know, will you take this money and, rather, and work for me? I've got a job. And, the, and supposedly the guy said, no, that's not what I want. I just want a handout. And I know that's not what he said, but that was the effect. Right. He turned down the work mm -hmm. for whatever, $9 an hour, whatever it was, 15 $15 an hour, because he did not want that. He preferred to, you know, just ask for the money. So mm -hmm. I, I, it, each one's unique, I think. Okay. Yeah, right. I, I agree. I, I definitely agree that each of those people you talk to, you're gonna find a whole different story. And um, some of them are really looking to change and others are quite satisfied, like the guy with the pig. Mm -hmm. Well, and I made the mistake of saying that at the last meeting that some people are perfectly happy to be uh, homeless and, and out there and, and the guy really called me to task for it. And I, you know, how do you know that? Oh, He's yeah. right, I don't know. I don't talk to homeless people. Right. I, I generally don't talk to homeless people, mm -hmm. so I don't know how they feel. But well, I, I do know there. that there is an analysis of the homeless issue, mm -hmm. right? We just got the report, mm -hmm. right? Um, the Alice report, or, or no? It's not the Alice. It's the um, there's a they go out and they do a survey, um, point in time survey. Point, yeah, time, point right. in time survey. No survey. And um, I, like I said, Community Coalition on Homelessness. <laughs> They, they also delve into this issue. So I guess I, I'm just saying that I think we got some good ideas, but I'm not sure I have enough information to make right. a good decision. Right, and I do think some of the people in the room can maybe help with some of that. I mean, I don't have all the answers and don't profess to, but right. I do think some of the people here can help us with some of these questions. Because we did a an agency survey and a community survey to find out about how people are giving and and you know, how many of the people in, with our agencies are reporting that are probably out there asking for money or are living rough? Right. So. Well, I certainly, I, I love the discussion and we're going to continue going. Commissioner Bellamy? Well, I'm right in the middle of all this right here. Um, as far as the, the next steps, um, the awareness campaign, um, and this, at the other meeting, at the last meeting we had, I came up with the acronym. Uh, Manatee's Better Way program, and um, these three uh, should be our, our almost like our core values of that Better Way program in order for us to help. Just in my in my opinion, I'm not necessarily sure how that looks, but the campaign <coughs> is is one thing. I would definitely support um, the Day Work Pilot program 
Um, I'm not sure how the county administrator feels about these numbers, and I always proceed with caution, with caution when it comes down to the numbers, which takes me um, to the hot team. Um, and I had a, a meeting, and it's always good to see the sheriff. I, I, I had a meeting uh, with, with the sheriff and some representation from Sarasota, and I let you all know that we were going to that meeting. Um, and we talked about um, the hot teams, and the first number that came out, um, I'm not sure if he's in here, but the guy threw out a million dollars. Hold on, look, my man. That's not, where, <laughs> that's not where we are. We have to crawl. We have to crawl before we walk. We have to look at, look, look at all this. Um, but the interesting thing about it, is um, the support and the passion um, that our sheriff department, um, the, the sheriff and the deputies that were there, um, they were very inquisitive, asked a lot of questions, um, wanted to know um, what the options are. And I do think we have the ability um, to look at the day work pilot program and the homeless outreach teams. And here's the reason why. It has a lot to do with everybody in here mm -hmm. as far as what services that they're providing and how we can take and put all that together. I don't necessarily think it's about um, a dollar at this point that comes from the county, but it is, um, and this is why I'm a little different at, because I actually thought workshops where everybody be actively engaged and coming up with ideas and things of that nature right there. Um, and for this particular workshop, what I thought we should kind of get out of this is, you know, the services that are provided, and you all have done a great job for doing that. Thank you. And which ones kind of have that connectivity? that we need. So um, if there's going to be a need for a bed, mm -hmm. all right, if there's going to be a need for, um, for, for medical care, if there's going to be a need for nutrition, you know, we just had a powerful meeting about, you know, the, the food bank and things of that nature right there. But how does that come together? Right. Now, Commissioner Whitmore um, also supported it, but the, the bike side, the return on the investment, um, in one of my briefings, and I'm sorry if I'm a little long-winded, but this is me right here. Okay. So in one, in one of my briefings, um, um, Kate and um, one of the other young ladies, and I can't think of the name, but they, we talked about an individual um, that was responsible for a, a lot of health care. Um, and I can't think of the scenario that they gave me, but that's what we want to know. We want to know if we take and we pilot you know, a program for a year, you know, and we know this individual has possibly been arrested, and then we know that they need, you know, certain health care support. We had to provide them with the bed and all of them. Looking at those numbers and say, we stop this right. bill mm -hmm. from, from going higher and higher. And, and I'm not necessarily sure um, what that formula mm -hmm. looks like, but I think we kind of need to have those different um, variables so we can be prepared for it, so we can have that support, so we will know what our return on investment um, would, would potentially would potentially be right now. What I'm what I'm what I'm hearing um, is there's a, a case. It, what's his name? Million Dollar Billy or Billion Dollar? Is it Million Dollar Billy? Mm -hmm. Come on, Kate, help me out so we don't lose this. It's been a long day for all of us. <laughs> Kate Zamboni, uh, you're referring to Million Dollar Billy from the city of Tampa. That was. Can you just brief him real quick, and then I'll piggyback off of you. Um, so we had in preparing for our conversation on the 24th. I had met with a man who identified himself as a homeless outreach consultant. He was a retired police officer from the city of Tampa. He had emailed Commissioner Servia after listening to some of the initial conversations on this topic and offered to help. His name is Daniel McDonald. And um, I met with him along with Renice Remy, and he shared with us um, Tampa's, what they called the million dollar billy. And they calculated how often that gentleman had been incarcerated, his use of emergency services in the hospitals for general health care, um, and, and calculated that he was costing the city of Tampa a million dollars. And it took multiple times. He is probably not the kind of guy who the first time the bus goes around is going to jump on and say he wants to work. And I think that was part of, um, of Director Ida's comments that it does take multiple times. And even though somebody may have cho made that choice today, it doesn't mean next year that's the same choice they would make if, if there's another option. So... Um, we don't know if we have a million dollar billy, but um, I, I think what you're saying is if, if there is, we should. Right, and, I'm, and, I'm, and everybody will probably keep it internally, but I'll be honest, which I'm sure we do. Um, and we need to find a way to, to, to kind of decrease that because when we start talking about the health care um, from the jail and how we look at that, I mean, that's one of the variables that can go in that formula for us to potentially get our return on our investment. So I'm thinking that's one of the directions we want to. We want to take, but from the, the the partners, the individuals that's out there, and you all are aware 
of the services that you all provide. Uh, I just want us, if it's okay, to be mindful um, of, of the, the medical care. I'm not necessarily sure what they provide. That's never good when he walks out. Well, <laughs> and I think our Good Joshua afternoon. Barnett has really done a lot of research, too, in, in how often people are hitting the emergency rooms. Um, sorry. The sheriff just left. No. Oh. Kevin's still here. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Kevin. I don't, I, if I would have known that, I would have let them speak. Right. I, I didn't yeah. know they had to leave. Nobody said anything, so, so that's too bad. But sorry, go ahead, Reggie, didn't mean to interrupt. That, that kind of distracted me, to be honest with you. But I, I think what I want to do is hear from the sheriff. Potential, yeah, I'm going to text him, Max, can you come back? Again? The potential um, partners or the potential individuals out there that offer those services, and what can we do um, to, to kind of identify data? As far as who are you all serving and what some of the needs are, and are from the from the homeless or from the panhandling um, area, and what what recommendations do they have? So I, I guess Commissioner Benack, my next step with me trying to get over him walking out is to um, identify. Can we hear from the um, from the partners real quick? Yeah, I think that's going to be important. I'm going to let uh, Commissioner Trey speak. Then we're going to go to Sherry. Then we're going to go to everyone. Okay, Misty. Yeah. Okay. I'll be very quick. Um, Sorry to hear that someone's being discriminated for having a pet pig, but uh, <laughs> they're much smarter than dogs. As someone that's had both things. I actually, um, I've actually talked to Ed when Ed was still here, so that's been quite a while, mostly about homeless kids, because that really, really bothers me. And I kind of started thinking, we don't have beds in this county. And, that, and I'm like, what can we do? And But it got kind of overwhelming, because I was thinking of these container homes for a temporary home. But then you have to change the zoning to get to there. Most of the where the homelessness is is the city of Bradenton. I mean, because it would be ridiculous to have a great place in Lakewood Ranch. That's not where the homeless are. They're here. Uh, so I, too, would like to hear the people just to kind of see. I'm all for working and stuff, but I think it's a mental health addiction. Um, I think we need to make sure that the professionals tell us what the problem is. I think sometimes we answer questions that aren't. You know, it's helpful, but it's not necessarily going to help the problem. And that's the one thing I want to do is help the problem. And I think we have to listen to the professionals that tell us what would be the most helpful. So, Thank you. Sherry, do you have anything you want to add? I was just going to update, just tell you uh, many, uh, the part, bad part of being around here a long time, many of these people that you're looking at here, and I all participated in writing that 10 year plan to end homelessness. It was adopted in August of 2006. And then think about when that was. We had a lot of things we were trying to do. We were trying to push things out, and everybody helped write it. We had an action plan, and then the housing industry plummeted and everybody was in trouble. So um, we have some great organizations. Manatee County's got some fantastic nonprofits that work with everyone. But obviously, one of the issues, commissioners, was that something like that uh, report can't be run by the government. Right. And it has to be a community effort. And right. to try to hand that off uh, was difficult at that time as everybody was struggling. So it's encouraging, you know, to hear and to see everybody back again because... We, I know exactly where that report is, and it would be a great start I mean, uh, to kind of re-look mm -hmm. re at it and see how we're doing. Sure. Good. Okay. Well, we're going to go ahead and ask if there's anyone here that would like to speak. I don't have anyone signed up um, to speak, but please come forward, state your name for the record, and uh, let us know what you have to share. Hi, Commissioners. My name is Chris Johnson. I am the CEO at Suncoast Partnership to End Homelessness. We are the lead agency for the Continuum of Care in Manatee and Sarasota County. I spoke before you just, I think, last week or a week before. Uh, so good to see you guys again. Um, in this conversation, uh, you are right. You have an amazing group of agencies in Manatee County uh, to answer this call and to really solve this problem. A couple of things I was thinking as everyone was talking that I wanted to offer just as some framework um, as you are working on solutions for this and the right solution for Manatee County. A couple of things just to know, um, we have a coordinated entry one by one name list of everyone in Manatee County and Sarasota County that have 
participated in coordinated entry. They are homeless individuals, literally homeless, and they are prioritized on that list according to acuity. Uh, we use the VI SPADAT, we use length of time homeless, chronic homeless status, veteran status, all sorts of things to govern that list. As of yesterday, there were 981 people on that list. Wow. In Manatee County, just so you know the breakdown of, of kind of who's out there right now, and we kind of break this down into three categories. So if we use VI SPADAT scores, which is a vulnerability index, it is a tool that was created by Ian DeJong to help prioritize entry. So we score it 1 to 16, and it's scored by the person themselves self-reporting. 1 to 3, there is no need for an intervention. They're going to self-resolve on their own with very little help. A 4 to 8 is a high acuity score, primarily rapid rehousing individuals. The third is anywhere 9 and above, which is permanent supportive housing. Those are individuals who have they're the highest acuity and have mental health, substance abuse, physical disabilities, all sorts of things where they're going to need a lot of assistance. In Manatee County right now, that lowest acuity, that one to three, you have 49 people on that list that are going to self-resolve. That middle range, the rapid rehousing folks, 89. The permanent supportive housing level, the highest acuity of need, 93. So those are the groups that you have that need to be a focus on. And again, as far as funding that's coming from the federal government through HUD, all of that money gets prioritized. That's our rapid rehousing, permanent supportive housing money that flows through us as the lead agency. So just so you know who's out in the field, that's kind of what you're looking at. So it would be good to have someone, you, case management is key to this, absolutely. You have to have really good case managers. Mental health professionals have to be involved at some level. I mean, you have great service providers here for both of those. Um, so those are some things just at the kind of global level of looking at who needs to be served in Manatee County. A couple of other things as you guys were looking at some of the options that were put together, which I think are a great variety of options. Um, the beauty is just south, you have great models that are working well. Um, the idea of a day work program. The Salvation Army Sarasota, where I served for eight years, when I started there back in 2011, um, they had, oh, I ran out of time. Go ahead. Okay, we're, we're learning. Um, they had started street teams. So street teams was a program that was designed for, with 15 beds at the Sarasota shelter. Okay, here you have 114 beds for individual males at the shelter in uh, Manatee County at Salvation Army. Those 15 beds had a case manager, a housing monitor driver. That was what uh, was covered by those beds. Beds are like $35 a night is what they charge right now per. So for 15 beds, that's around $191,000 to do that. Those 15 individuals volunteered, uh, in this case downtown. Uh, they picked up trash. They helped clean the parks. Uh, they did all sorts of those things. The other half of the afternoon, and again, the, the Salvation Army provided breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and housing which was the one component that I didn't hear answered yet, was where are the people when they get done with their work day? Um, that's a big piece. They have to have some sort of stable place to stay to be able to get that cognitive slack that they're going to need to make that transition back into housing. So the model in Sarasota is working well. They house 100 people a year on average um, through street teams by itself. And those are individuals who get employment and also end up in housing. They're low acuity, and they're mainly going to be, they're going to be able to self-resolve uh, because they can be employed. They're able-bodied adults. They're not adults with exceptions. Uh, so that's one model that works, and you have a neighbor just south who's doing it well and has been doing it for uh, about eight years. So you can always look at that model as an option for what it looks like in the Sun Coast, right? So that's uh, something just to think about. The hot teams, by all means, are successful down there. And uh, Commissioner Bellamy, you had made a comment about the, the million-dollar price tag that was thrown out there for hot teams. Mm. Um, hot teams, even in Sarasota, were scaled. They started with six beds. They didn't start with 50. You know? So now there's 50, but they started with six. And the county and the city each took 25 of those. Right. Um, but it was initiated with just six beds, a couple case managers, and it worked really well. Again, that $35 a night that Sarasota um, actually says, this is what it costs per day, per bed for a person, covers case management, food, and then shelter. So. Twelve fifty a night's the per diem, uh, federal per diem for shelter. About sixteen fifty for a case manager, and then you have the other with six dollars in food. So it covers it really well, um, and that's kind of where they base that price off of. But it does work really well. Um, so, and I, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Benat talking about the housing component of so where are these folks housed because that is an important component on anyone ending their homelessness, even if it's just a bridge shelter bed. 
that works to move into housing because then a case manager is right there on site with that person and can help them overcome those barriers to housing that they're going to have. The backgrounds, the, the mental health, the substance abuse, all of those other things can get dealt with at that point. So it works really well in that model. Um, the other thing, you were asking about return on investment, Commissioner Bellamy. Um, a great way of gauging that, especially when you're looking at human services, is going to be our CSIS service system, which is our community services information system. HUD mandates that everyone have a homeless management information system, an HMIS program or database. Uh, we have CSIS here in the COC, right? So in our continuum of care, that's what we call it because we use it for not just homelessness, but for prevention as well. So it's kind of broad spectrumed. But it is a way you can gauge those results because you get to see the outcomes. You can run reports out of there easily to say, this is the number of people that got housed, here's the number of people that got employment, here's the number of people that moved from homelessness into housing. So it's a nice, easy way to look at that return on investment, um, not just from a dollar amount, but also from the human services side as well. Um, I will say that those price tags uh, for that program, even at $35 a night, is about 191000 So again, for that street teams program. And the hot, you could start off with six, 10 beds and it would work. So just, just given some kind of overarching look at this of saying, here's who the folks you have to serve. Um, odds are you're gonna need a component of mental health that's in there, um, that someone who's a provider who can offer that. A strong case management group, um, we've seen that over and over and over again, that case management is that key, because they're the coordinator. They're the ones who are coordinating all the other services and component parts to make those initiatives successful. Without them, it's really difficult to do it. Um, it really, really is, so. Um, any questions for me? I have any questions, um, and I, I, you know, I know that Sarasota, because you know, just following again on the paper, they um, they've struggled. They had Dr. Marbet or whatever his name was that got hired, and is that, do I have the right name? Yeah. Um, and the city and the county have struggled. Who does what? Because what's a city responsible? But you know, we can learn from that. They've gone through this battle, right? for a while, mm -hmm. and now I'm thrilled to hear that they have programs that are working so we can learn from what, what has worked and hopefully not have to repeat all the mistakes they've had, and, and I think that it's very valuable, especially when you talk about federal dollars, because you're getting the federal dollars are coming through to your um, organization, right? Mm -hmm. But obviously we're eligible to take advantage of some of those federal dollars, right? Absolutely. Okay. All right, Commissioner Bellman. Can I dial up? Um, so we can, you all can know where we are. Uh, myself and um, Chris and the sheriff, we're negotiating times for us to meet. Um, and the municipalities between Sarasota County and the city of Sarasota and how they do their hot teams are totally different. And the approach that we're going to take is communicate with both. Um, I do have a relationship with Nick. Nick Bell, mm -hmm. uh, who is one of the hot team individuals in Sarasota that's actually on the ground. He's given me a lot of information. He's been great, um, by the way. But we want to, in my opinion, want to hear from both entities so we can learn that I can bring more information back. And I'm going to take it back to the Public Safety Council meeting also. So, again, we can look at, you know, what our options are. But my, my only concern when we start talking about, you know, dollars, of course, and how it look, but when, when, I know. What I what I would hope is that the county administrator would have somebody from staff. Um, I know we don't have a lot of staff, but might be able to shadow and be in these meetings so that they can bring a report back to all of the board. Obviously, you know you're you're um, want to be point person for this, but I would encourage you to have a staff person who could um, you know take notes and bring us back to a, us for discussion. But I think that's Dr. Remy. Mm -hmm. I, uh, is is it her? I, I think that's her. <laughs> yeah. um, she's the person that gave me all the other information. <laughs> So. Our criminal justice liaison. Right, right. Yes. I, I would leave it to the county administrator to figure out who's the best person. As we talk about these homeless programs right. and the hot program, and I mean, it's kind of mixed because obviously the hot program is, and I, I didn't really understand that. So that's a program run by the sheriff, but it includes beds. So yes, so the both the county and the city have contracted with the Salvation Army in Sarasota for bed so space. Okay. Salvation the, Army provides the beds. The okay. officers are the ones who put the individuals into the bed. They govern it. So the county, um, the sheriff's department governs who goes in the county beds. And then there's case management at the Salvation Army that work along with the case managers that the county has as well to create a coordinated effort. Because the hot teams are primarily higher acuity individuals. They're okay. people that are being brought in right. rather than coming in like street teams. Right. So. Okay. Other questions? 
Okay, thank you very much. That was very You're welcome. Is it okay if I say one more thing? And that is just a, your ROI question. There was a great Surgeon General's report that came out in 2016 that showed the offset for treatment of substance abuse and mental health issues as $1 for treatment offsets $4 in healthcare costs and $7 in law enforcement costs. So it's an interesting that was put out by the Surgeon General of the United States. So it's a good report to take a look at for some ROI on that. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. Other folks who want to present on this issue or give us their opinion. Anybody else want to share? Please come forward. State your name for the record. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Beverly Hill, and I'm here on behalf of Hey, <laughs> we'll give you a, we'll give you a little more time my name. Than that. <laughs> I'll try again. My name is Beverly Hill. I'm here for Turning Points. Adele is actually over in Orlando at a, a conference this week and has asked for me to come in her stead. Um, I'm a native of Bradenton. I was born here and have lived here for a very long time. And I've lived away and I've come back. And my whole background is in health promotion, wellness, and social sciences. So it gives you a little bit of perspective. When I came back to Bradenton a few years ago, it was because my mom's health was declining. She was a nurse for many years, who I believe you worked with, too. Oh, my gosh. Um, and been around. Around. <laughs> <laughs> It has been a very interesting <laughs> return for me coming back to Bradenton because there are many things about it that I remember very fondly that are still the same, but there are also a lot of new challenges. When I saw that uh, homelessness was a big one, I knew that that was an area that I could do some good, and that's how I landed at Turning Points. So... My role for the past three years there has been to serve as the manager of the Open Door Resource Center. So my area is the one that um, people come through every day that need basic wraparound services. They're the ones that are coming right off the street because they need a shower, they need their clothes washed, they need some clothes, that kind of thing. Um, we're open Monday through Friday from 8.30 a.m. to 2 p.m., and in that short period of time on those days, we see an average of around 100 to 150 individuals come through the door. Um, it's been very interesting in making my way around town to see that very few of the individuals that come through our door every day at that end are panhandling. At least I'm not seeing them. Um, I did a little experiment about six months ago when everything was hitting the headlines and the big discussion started on this topic, and I started to pay attention to the major intersections. Who did I recognize? Who did I not? And in that six-month period, I can say with confidence that there were only about five or six people total during that time that I recognized. So that caused me to think a little bit more about how are we actually helping? Um, how are we getting the word out about what resources we do have available? And then what percentage of the population of the people that are panhandling, number one, know about us and then are actually using our services? So. Adele and I have had some interesting conversations about this, and I know that we agree on one thing, and that is due to our observation, there are a lot of people out there that may not be homeless that are panhandling. So we do have the perspective of safety um, as a priority, and I can tell you that one of our key employees, and this is someone who does intake, so she sees a lot of the people firsthand day in and day out, um, had her three children in the car with her one weekend and was going to a sporting event for her kids. And someone who we serve came right up to her window at one of the main intersections and started knocking on the window. Probably didn't even realize it was her. But um, this was very uh, notable to me because this is somebody who does receive our services, um, who clearly has an ongoing issue. He's been coming for services the entire time I've been there mm -hmm. for three years, but has not been able to make that jump. Um, and largely due to alcoholism, but there may be many other factors involved. So um, he's one of the few, but most of the people that I see, as I said, that come through the door, um, I do not see out panhandling. Okay. I'm very much in favor, and I know Adele is as well, of a public education campaign. I like a lot of the ideas I saw, um, but for the very reason I just stated, I think that it would be a very good idea to maybe consider use of the slogan that we used to have in place, I believe. Um, spare change is not real change, to include it on potentially posters around town in key areas. Some of the places you were mentioning, um, collecting cans, 
why not go ahead and duplicate that message at those places, right? Let's, let's get two issues taken care of with one action. Um, in addition to that, maybe on the sides of buses, park benches, the places that people frequent and the places maybe that people see homeless individuals so they make that connection might be one idea. Um, a couple of other quick stories, just briefly, um, is that Adele and I were talking recently, and she had mentioned that on her way home from work over a period of time, and not very much time, um, she had seen one gentleman with three different women with the same message each time, mm -hmm. but different women, holding signs, please help me and my family, had a different woman, I guess he has three families, or he's just, <laughs> you know, posing. Um, but th this just illuminated the problem for her and um, helped us to know that, you know, there are some things going on out there that might need to be tackled in a different way. Um, I know that uh, probably the, the cost is high when you talk about permitting panhandlers, and so that might not be the most popular method, but I do feel like we do need to take a multifaceted approach. Um, we do need to raise awareness among the populace and the people who, are, uh, who have heartstrings where they do want to give and help them to connect ways to give in other ways. So thank you very much for your time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. To go on down, please. Hi, I'm Julie Showers. I'm from the Salvation Army. I'm the program director and business administrator. Uh, the Salvation Army is one of is the only homeless shelter in Manatee County. Uh, we do have um, beds for men and for families, and we are um, every night putting families on the floor in our family shelter because we have six rooms. Five of those are for families. One is for single women. And so we're constantly um, turning families away because we do not have space because the fire marshal has set a limit to how many people we can have on the floor. The same is for our men's shelter. We have recently made some changes in our shelter that we feel are um, helping people to get out of the situation that they're in. Um, we haven't... Um, We've had the same beds that we've had since that shelter has opened. So I don't uh, know if there's some rumors going around that Salvation Army doesn't have as many beds as they used to, but we have the same amount of beds as we have. We're constantly changing our programs to meet the needs of the community. We are partners with the uh, coalition. We do receive some funding from them to run our shelter. Um, so we are, um, like I said, we're constantly changing our program. In our men's shelter alone, we do have a VA program. It's a contract with the VA. It's a 30-day per diem. The VA is coming in, and our case managers are working to get veterans moved out and to be successful again. We do have a Department of Corrections uh, program where <coughs> people who are wanting to come back out of prison, we're getting them back on their feet again and helping them be successful. We have a um, drug and alcohol um, where we send men to the Salvation Army in St. Pete to a free drug and, drug and alcohol program. Um, we also have an overnight program and we have a work program. And so the changes that we made recently in our work program, I'd like our program manager to um, share with you what those are. But just know that people, um, that there are people's lives are being changed, but we can do more. But we need um, more funding and we need more wraparound services for people because people need those mental health, they need those life skill classes, they need all of those things to come and surround them to help them be successful. And there really isn't funding for wraparound services. And so if we had more funding for wraparound services, then we uh, could help people even more. So I'm gonna let Brian um, Payne, our program manager for our shelters, I'm gonna let him speak a little bit about some of the changes that we made but we're constantly making changes and looking at best practices to see what is best for um, the homeless people that we serve. And I'm super happy you guys are talking because I re the Salvation Army would really like to have a collaborative effort with the county and the city because we are related. We are actually in the city, and sometimes we get a little resistance from the city. So if we could work together, that would really be great. Great. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Brian Payne. I am the uh, program manager for the shelters at the Salvation Army here in Bradenton. Um, the changes that we made recently were really geared towards the limited resources that we had, 
couldn't change them, couldn't really increase the number of beds that we had available. And so how do we make the most impact on the lives of the people that are needing those services? And it really came down to the fact that giving somebody a bed for the night and not providing any other services to help them does not really help them. It gets them off the street, it gives them a place to put their head for the night, but it just allows them to go back out onto the streets the next day and do whatever they're doing and no life change actually happens. So what we did was we reduced the number of overnight beds that we had available, increased the number of beds that we had available for our work program, which is really towards getting the individual in, having them get into, um, we call it the work program, but it doesn't really necessarily require full-time employment. You know, we talked about the fact that full-time employment doesn't fit everybody. Um, so what we look for is we look for the individual to have full-time equivalent income, whether that's a full-time job, whether it's two part-time jobs, whether it's disability and a part-time job, or just Social Security that's enough to su sustain the person. We know that housing in Manatee County is not getting any cheaper. Um, if you're making $780 a month on disability, you're probably not going to survive in this county without having something else to help supplement that. So we really try to encourage people um, break down that stigma of the fact that if you're disabled, you cannot work. That's not true. <laughs> I send people over to Career Source Suncoast every day to talk to them about Ticket to Work so they can get with Social Security and find out what am I really allowed to do to not hurt my benefits, but also be able to have enough income so that I can actually get a job. I mean, have, a, have enough income to be able to get back into housing and be sustainable. So that's the push that we've really made at this point. You guys have probably heard a lot about it. We've been on the news um, that, you know, we've shut all these things down and we really haven't. Um, we've just shifted our focus into the things that we felt like at this point we're doing the most good for the community. Thank you. Carol, you had a question? Yeah, about Salvation Army, because I watched ABC7 last night and yes, it <laughs> cut down um, 90 beds and they were complaining. That was not correct. They were complaining that they were coming to theirs. I know. You know, I was young and I didn't have a place to stay. I was homeless for a while, but I stayed with friends, so I had a bed. But when you don't provide them an overnight place to sleep, they got to sleep on the streets. So what? And they paid for that. So why did you do that? And it's nothing critical. I'm no. just. It's limited beds. If we had unlimited space, we would take in everybody that we could that was able to to pay for the beds. We don't have unlimited space. Um, we have. Because of the limited space we have, we can either make the decision that we're going to continue to fund all of those beds towards overnight beds, which don't make significant life change, or we can keep a certain number of beds that are for, um, for those individuals, but push more of the beds towards the case-managed programs that are actually going to be able to work with the individual on budgeting and life skills and substance abuse and those types of things that play into homelessness because homelessness is not just about a roof over your head i know but when you it's hard to case manage when you don't have a place to sleep that's correct and so what here so let me explain what we do there so we actually allow everybody who comes into the salvation army lodge we allow seven nights free um, annually so if you come in today and you use up your first your seven nights free during that seven days we're trying to really engage that individual to find out why are you homeless? What's going on with your situation? A lot of times we, when they come in during that first seven days, we find out that there's opportunities available to divert that person. They have family or friends that could help out, but they really don't want to talk to them about it because they don't want to live by their rules. But when you come down to the choice of living by somebody else's rules or being homeless, you know, it, it's, it, it starts making a little bit more sense to you. <laughs> okay. So yeah. during that seven days, we try to push them into one of those case-managed programs and then... Um, you know, but we we're not we still have the, the emergency overnight shelter beds, and they still don't have a place to sleep, and it's nothing critical. I'm not. No, that, I understand. That's not my deal, but um, I don't do that. Um, I'm not like that. But have you thought about? And I know this is weird, and this would be zoning. I mean, this is Bradenton actually, but uh, for more housing, like container housing, and I um, mean, you know, the 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 small tiny housing for your. <laughs> And, and I get it. It's just you have only been the only place that I know of where people could go to sleep, and they pay. And now, and I in Sarasota, and again, I'm just listen, I just heard the news last night. Uh, they're complaining because the, our clients are going down there, and so it's kind of straining their resources down there for sleeping. So, just maybe if you could provide us, because this is probably in the forum, mm -hmm. if you could provide us something in writing to our administrator, she could copy us on what's going on. Sure. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, and another thing too is just while you're talking about that, um, 
our, our new major here in town, he's been with us now since late May, I believe, uh, Major Guadalupe. Unfortunately, he's out of town right now and wasn't able to be here, but he has been at other shelters, other Salvation Armies across the country, has seen different things as well, and he has some great ideas for some emergency shelter beds that you can open up without having to do a lot of bricks and mortar type stuff too. So there's, I, I think there's some opportunities people, there to be creative and do some things if we can get well, the partnerships if, 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 if I could people clarify, on the streets. If I could clarify, so you said you have the same number of beds, it does but you're them. keeping the beds for people that are willing to be in a program where they're trying to change rather yes, than just keeping people night after night off the street. They have the same number of beds, but it's a different... You have we a have different just philosophy. We have model. just shifted the, the philosophy. But correct. usually the ones that can't case don't case managers are the, the ones that really need it because they're not getting it. They have other issues and they're not going to be as compliant as others. Well, but I, I, that's another discussion. I'm going to echo the same thing that the lady from Turning Point said a few minutes ago. When I drive down 14th and I look at all the major intersections and stuff like that and I see the people panhandling, I don't recognize any of them. It's not our clients. It's not the people that are coming in seeking homeless services. Right, and we know it's the mental yeah. health issue. I mean, I've written that down like three times. Commissioner Bellamy. <coughs> Sorry. Um, how many number of beds do you have? So we have 114 total beds in our um, men's shelter, and we have a total of available beds of 50 in our family and women's shelter. It kind of depends on the, the family composition in those six rooms. So yeah. overall, you have 254. No, no, 164. Oh, that's bad math. 164. <laughs> He's a teacher. Too. Yeah, uh, 164. <laughs> and, uh, or, was that an offer to add more beds? Don't you? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I don't know if it's probably this bad. <laughs> yeah. and just, I'm just curious. Um, what's the cost per bed per night? Our business administrator would probably So in the family shelter, our cost. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Kelly French. Our cost to operate that program in the family shelter is $37 a night. It's just shy of that um, in the men's shelter. Because a family, you think about you're feeding a family of three or five as opposed to in the men's shelter you're feeding one. Can I, can I rephrase my question? For, for a homeless person that comes in for one night. They get help? seven nights free and that. then it's $10 a night. $10 right. per night. All right. For the rest of the year they can pay $10 per night? Mm -hmm. Space available? Yes, they can. And what percentage of your funding do you get through donations? The majority of it. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> about 80%. About 80%. We get about 17000 from the county for the men's shelter and about... Uh, 70000 70000 for the family shelter? Yep. For the family shelter. We got a lot of work to do on this. Okay. Well, um, we want more beds. Got to get more money. Right. Sorry, that's Bottom the way it line. is. So... Don't no, think that, uh, I don't like what about the think. ones that are still sleeping on the sleet streets now and they're going, we decrease their, nothing against you. I'm just, there's no other place but you guys to um, sleep overnight. But they but don't have unlimited resources. But they have those beds. Are, they, are you full every night? We are not full every night, Because no. they don't. They all went to Sarasota because they're not allowed to stay there. That is also the not system. correct if you look at the data that's in the, the CSIS system. We, we, we definitely not here. One yeah. no. question to beat, to beat up on you. No. Um, sir, on average, how many um, open beds do you have per night, sir? In the family lodge, we are almost always full overnight um, just because of the, the composition there. On the men's side, I would say we probably have... 10 beds open each night. It varies because most nights we have 14 available overnight beds that we use. Most nights we have four to five of those empty. We're not even filling those up. So it's not like we're turning men away because we don't have space. They're, they're just not coming in. So when it's cold, no, it's yeah. yeah, and, and you know, I, it, <laughs> people need to change. We can't just have people continue to repeat the same behavior over and over again. Right. You don't change. If you're mentally ill, it's hard then to Then you need change. mental ill. Then they're they're not they're not providing mental um, yeah. health. Yeah, you I'm know? Not talking that, about that. That's it, it, it does, excuse me, with all due respect, and I apologize, it does open up the opportunity to bring forth those wraparound services. Mm -hmm. right. and, it, and if you have an open bed and you have a potential heart team and you have a potential health care or mental health um, support, I think that's where it can start. I'm not trying to change anything, but I think that's where it can start. And I think that's what we're talking about. What are our options? Right. And, and once we have an hot team, we may need a bed. 
and then we can utilize the wraparound services. I think that's where we're going. We're not going to get there today, but that's why I'm taking the type notes yeah. that I'm taking. Okay, and, I, and, and again, it's about the funding. We get it, you right. know. <laughs> if Steve was here, that's what he'd say. <laughs> what does he say? We, we know the what. The answer is the money. No, he, no Steve would say money is the answer. Yes, sir. What's, What's the question? question? There you go. Put that on the, put that, show that on the record. This is what he left. This is his comment. It was $2. Dollar sign. Before he handled it. So we all know that, that that's an issue. But thank you. Thank you for yeah, what you guys do. You. And I know that we're coming into the Christmas season. I know I'll be ringing the bell for thank Salvation you. Army. I want people to support you. I mean, mm -hmm. we've had an a incredible emotional day today, at least for me. I feel like I've been run over by a truck at this point, <laughs> that, um, you know, hearing about the needs in this community, and you guys are out there every day working on it. So we appreciate your partnership. And I did not watch it, but I'm not a big fan of being attacked on TV. I've been there and had that done to me. So <laughs> sorry that happened to you. Well, it Just wasn't an attack. No. It was, they were very civil. <laughs> All know. right. They're Thank you. Sarasota. Other folks who want to. I thought it was you guys, but I guess it was Sarasota. Other folks that want to share, please come forward or, with your comments. Hi, good evening, uh, commissioners. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Jean, and I'm the program coordinator and community liaison with the Academy of Glengarry. Thank you for your time this evening, and thank you for the invitation from uh, Ava. And uh, I just want to just briefly give you a little bit of a description of the Academy of Glengarry and, and a little bit about what we do. Um, so we're we're based in, in Sarasota. Um, but we are a, we're a program that provides psychiatric uh, rehabilitation for adults who are living with severe and persistent mental illness. And the way that we do our psychiatric rehabilitation is by providing vocational training and uh, equipping people with skills mm -hmm. and socialization skills as well uh, for them to obtain and maintain employment. Um, and so we're not necessarily the first step for someone who um, is experiencing homelessness. Um, where we come in is in, in the space of prevention. Um, so f we're a place where uh, as people have those services and you know they're obtaining their, co their counseling and their, their therapy and also shelters, um, once, once they're, they're ready, they can um, get the training and services from our program so that they can find and maintain employment and so really prevention is is, is where we, we we work in and um, just giving people that structure and a place to come to be productive and to uh, to find community as well is 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 what we find to be essential in, in improving someone's um, not only their mental health but also the um, preventing them from going into homelessness as, as well um, so that's just a brief overview of what we do um, Yes, uh, I will also mention that although we're in Sarasota, about 10% of our community does come from Manatee County. Um, so, uh, and, and as time goes on, we've only been in, in existence for about a little over two years. So as time goes on, that, that might uh, continue to increase as we get the word out about our services. Um, so I just wanted to just give a brief overview of what we do. Um, not sure if there's any questions, but. Well, I wanna say thank you for being here. I was at the event. Um, that you had with uh, Turning Points at Benderson, um, what, I don't know, mm -hmm. well, within the last few weeks where we heard um, your director make a presentation and, um, and also the, uh, the woman who spoke with the um, mental health issues and talked about what it has meant, Glengarry, has meant to her to be able to um, get her life back on track and get off the street. So that was very compelling. So I was, I was thinking about that when we were talking about mental health. So um, you're, you guys are filling a need, um, and so um, thank you for coming here. Does anybody have any questions? And you're on Glengarry Street, I guess, um, in Sarasota, and you have a facility. Do people live there, actually stay there, or do they come in for day services? How does it work? Uh, yes, that's a great question. So we're non-residential, non so uh, no one lives there. Um, it's outpatient. But the, but they do come in and they get these services that help them get back on track. And, and people with se some severe issues, severe, um, you know, uh, substance abuse issues, right, that are able to come and get help there? Yes, yes. So, so we work with those who are living with severe and persistent mental illness, so um, bipolar, schizophrenia, anxiety disorder, um, and, and among other, other diagnoses as well. But, but yes, and, and, and thank you for, for sharing that. And, 
you know, I'll extend the invitation if, for those who haven't been to our program and you would like to take a tour, certainly um, reach out to us and, and we can uh, schedule something. Yeah, and I, I spoke to a parent who serves on your board. Uh, a mom and dad came up and talked to me about it and about the NAMI program, and mm -hmm. um, I learned a whole lot that day. So yeah. thank you for being here. Any other questions? Commissioner Whitmore, did you have a question? No, you didn't take me off. Oh, Commissioner Trace? I don't actually have a question for him if we're done with the oh. public, public Is there comments? anybody else who want to come up here thank and you. present Thank today? you, though. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, a lot of information once again. Not a whole lot of answers. Commissioner Trace? <laughs> actually, because uh, Ava actually asked us, she wanted some direction. Um, I would like to see us have a person through neighborhood services that is like the coordinator, uh, someone that's kind of in charge that goes out to these agencies, works with it, tries to find out the problems. I don't know, it could be something we have to get in next year's budget. I don't think we actually have someone now, but I think that there's just so much, so all of these people work a certain thing and they know a lot, I think for us trying to invent the wheel, but we have to have someone in our, to me in our orbit that is communicating with them and figuring out what we need to do and then coming back to us. Um, I have no problem with the day work, I think, but I really think we need to have someone that can organize what we need to do. And I think we need to have one person in charge of that. And mm -hmm. uh, I would say that we'd look at it in the budget next year and find somebody. It might be more than one person. You know, right. I, I, I'm envisioning a clearinghouse. For example, these two gentlemen back here that just spoke to you, to right. you all, we're exchanging business cards. Mm -hmm. right. Just now, as you were speaking, uh, Commissioner Trace, it, that, that, is, that is a very, that's a microcosm example of, of, of the fragmentation. All these organizations are doing great work. Right. Uh, but each of them, in, in some respects, is in individual silos. And so if there's a clearinghouse organization out there that... And so it that, has to work with the city also. Yeah, I so mean, anyway, those are could, just... It could uh, be more, but we don't have anyone today Those are just dumb knowledge. lawyers' Is that correct, thoughts. Ava? Pardon me? We have nobody today. Uh, uh, Bate, sure. I mean, every, we're kind of just piecemealing it. Yes, and it, this comes a lot of it, the information from our team that, you know, all the different divisions and the, the agencies that we work with. That's I, know what what I, I, can't, I know we're not them. voting or anything, but to me, that's what I think we mm -hmm. need. We need somebody that can take this on as a county employee and organize, work with these people. I think a lot of the answers is just coordination, make sure that we're not, people aren't duplicating what they're doing. And it's kind of like that would become the, uh, I don't even know if it needs to necessarily, it could be, it should come out of the sheriff's department. Maybe it should, well, I don't it comes know. comes out of ours. I don't know, but that's still our, I don't yeah, know. He's not here, he's out of motion. We no, still I'm pay for it. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, I'm not sure where, I'm not sure which department it needs to come out of. I would think neighborhood <laughs> services, no, but I think we need someone that <laughs> is the uh, top dog in this area. All right, oh. Commissioner Whitmore. Well, uh, Sherry, this has been your bailiwick for your, probably entire career here. Uh, you know what we have. You know if we're overlapping or not. You know if, if this position really needs to be created. I do support the work program, let me tell you that right now, but I would like to hear from you. I mean, you probably more than anybody in this room knows what resources we have and if this would work. We have to justify this with our taxpayers too. And if it's really something, I don't wanna wait another year. We've got the money, we know that. I mean, it's not in the budget, but we do have the money. So I'd like to hear from you as actually probably the expert in the room, and I really think you are. I know you're trying to <laughs> tell me breath. Congratulations. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've, yeah, a lot of people don't, don't like hearing that word results first, but that's the deal is... Right. We fund a lot of programs and we fund a lot of services and um, we, we need discussions like this there you direct us about what we need to be proving and what we need to be funding and how we need to be making results happen and so I think we have a lot of great programs out there we're happy to come back with a very comprehensive report so we can answer your questions and give you some examples. I know Ava, the rest of the team with Neighborhood Services that I, yes, know really well, and all the agencies, these are some great people. They're up against a lot, and we've heard a lot today about everything they are up against. Um, it kind of saddens me to say that, you know, 
we're still talking about this same problem. And Since does that make me an expert? I don't know if I'm very successful at it. But, um, yes, we will definitely, as we listen to your comments, we'll come back uh, soon. We will not take a long time. We'll come back together and give you some recommendations. Okay. Reggie. Uh, Commissioner yes. Serbia, oh. section four next. Yes, thank you. And, and so for me, what I'd like to see is um, a couple of things. I would like to do something sooner rather than later. Um, I, yes, so we can look at next year's budget. I agree with Priscilla to do some of these more expensive things, but I think that we have an opportunity to start educating the public, as we talked about, uh, with very little cost. We, we've already talked about we have the meters available at no cost. Um, signage is not very expensive. And I think that that effort really is going to align with our public safety ordinance that we're talking about as well. I think that's a really good match. So I'd like to see us do that as soon as possible because there isn't a lot of cost. And I'm glad you brought up uh, results first mm -hmm. because that is so important to think about what are the results going to be if we implement this program um, so that there is this return on investment that is kind of analyzed before we start spending money. Um, but I'm also in favor of the day work program. It sounds to me like it's already working in other cities. And I love when other cities have done things and they've gone through all the problems and we see it's already working. Mm -hmm. And then we can kind of piggyback on that and start something ourselves. So I'm in favor of both of those. But education should start right away. Please. Yeah. Uh, just to give direction, I'm, I'm not in favor of the day work uh, pilot program at this time. I don't think we have enough information. We heard from a lot of other pro programs that are going on, what the Salvation Army's doing. I don't want to replicate anything, so I'm not going to say, yeah, we need to move forward with that because, you know, they're already taking the, these folks off the street, you know. And whether or not these people that are homeless, that uh, not homeless, that are panhandling, whether or not they're willing to do that day work program. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen no evidence of that. That's not been presented to me as the problem that they can't get another job. Now, maybe there's other issues that they have, you know, other mental health issues perhaps, but it's not simply, I mean, we've got the lowest, lowest unemployment rate ever. You know, I, I'm not sure that creating another opportunity for work is is the answer. I'm not been convinced of that today, um, but I I am convinced that we need to have a better coordination effort. I don't know if it takes another person, but you know, I, I don't want to have another one of these in in two years and hear about what everybody else is doing. You know, if we're not gonna if we, if it isn't up to us to do anything, then we need to say that. But I don't think that we, you know, I, I agree with Priscilla. We need to, you know, and I've heard that from Adele for many, many years. We need a point person. We need a point person. And we got a lot of great partners, but we don't have a point person. So I'm in favor of that. Commissioner Bellamy. All right, a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, in respect to, to, to the sheriff and them having to leave, mm -hmm. they have their... Um, their award ceremony tonight, oh. and because our um, earlier meeting concerning the food bank went longer than we anticipated, it kind of jammed up their time. Um, but one statement that he did text me back okay. and say that we will do our part. They've joined the COC on board and working on it, and right. the, the hot team is the area from the sheriff department that we're looking at. Um, and I think that's going to be the collaboration with the sheriff department. So truthfully, we're talking about two instead of three now because we already know we're up and moving with one as far as how we're going to look at the hot team and the next steps in order for us to um, activate that. Um, the educational campaign, obviously, um, we need to start that. And I think that's one of our action steps that we can take immediately. Now, to uh, uh, address the point person, um, in this budget, they have a coordinator that they, they've identified as far as for the day work, for the day work program. Um, so that uh, maybe that could be possibly the point, the point person that kind of bring the, the different um, entities together and, and see how that collaboration um, looks. And that's just what was presented to us today. And again, that's part of the day work pilot program. And obviously I'm, I'm for that. Also, if, if we are, are, are are doing it the right direction. We can actually take a stab at all three 
mm-hmm. the, the way the way it sounds, the, the way the way it sounds um, from the presentation from staff and things like that, because the sheriff has basically said that he's going to do his part, which is a work in progress. The education campaign kind of speaks for itself, mm-hmm. and we all I think all of us well I agree I can't speak for no one else agree that we need to move forward on it. Um, so we're, this is where we are. Not not a, not a bad work session, and I like where we are with it. Mm-hmm. I really do. Commissioner Whitmore. Just uh, as we leave, uh, the majority of the board supports the work pilot program. One commissioner so far doesn't adamantly. The others wanted to look at it, so I don't want it to stop here. Um, Just so it's only a work session and we'll do something formal. But you're the only one that said you don't support it right now. Priscilla and the others say have. she supported no, she, it. She mentioned that she was look would look at it. I so there's I, four I, of us. I mean, I'd look at it, but yeah. I mean. Yeah, we're not definitely saying no now. At least three, four of us aren't. I'm not sure that's going to solve the panhandling well, problem, though. We'll, we'll talk. Right I'll let our administrator find out. Maybe well, I would we'll. mention, you know, we have the homeless outreach program already funded it through an agency. And we just need a little bit of time to get back with them to see what it would take to expand, you know, that slightly. Um, and also we have, you know, um, Chris came up and talked to uh, Suncoast Partnership mm-hmm. to end homelessness, which is really the, you know, the, the clearinghouse, the, the collaborator for both counties. So we just need to take a look at what we're currently doing and, and, and see where the gaps are right now. And also with our beds, obviously you're going to hear that. And we have heard that with our mental health, our substance abuse, our homelessness. So, you know, it could be that we're coming back and we're going to say, um, you know, I just wrote down, how about an adopt a bed program? Mm-hmm. You know, how about something where we really look at adding beds because that's one of the bigger issues. So we, we promise we will not delay. We will bring these back when we think we're ready with them, both the day program, if it's part, if it's a continuation of something that's already being done, the educational program. We think, we totally agree for, as staff that the educational component not only helps Um, the individuals that might be in need, but it helps our citizens who we really, we want to help give them options for being fearful out there of of whether they're giving or not giving and giving them various options. So we're we're definitely working on that. Yeah, and and we're moving really quick. I mean, this this just came up when we had the ordinance. We just all found out about it. This workshop was uh, a chance to talk about it more fully. We've had some great input. I think we are moving quickly. I think we don't want to jump into funding one program at the cost of another program. That's my concern. We don't have unlimited resources, much as I love the way y'all think. <laughs> and we, but we do have um, to to be able to fund certain programs. We have to make dis- we have to make some tough decisions. Mm-hmm. So I think we've learned a lot here today. I mean, I certainly have. Yeah. Um, and I I look yeah. forward to continuing this discussion, Sherry. You know what I heard today in both the work session work sessions that collaboration is hard. Mm-hmm. Right. We all think we do it the best, and um, everybody gets very focused. And working together for right. either wraparound or joining programs takes a lot of effort. And I think to give our agencies a big um, hand for all the work they do every day, you have to have time to collaborate too. And so I think that's the role the county plays is to ask for that collaboration and to reward it with results-based funding and programming that helps the citizens. Well, and Commissioner Bellamy. Last thing, the same way we um, got the big um, potential open bed count from the Salvation Army, can we communicate with Centerstone? Yeah. Because if an individual is having a mental health issue, yeah. that bed does not need to go to the Salvation Army. That bed needs to go to Centerstone. So bring back all the bed counts yeah, because yeah, um, I think Laurel just stepped out and that's and you have your women's shelter. We have Manti right. Children's Services. You have all the beds that are in the county in your we're going to hear aren't enough. Right. Right. And then when we talk about wraparound services, what does that mean? Yes. I mean, it's wraparound services could mean a lot of things. I, I was thinking about when I heard, you know, what does that mean exactly? Comprehensive. So. Yeah, so thank you for your time today on this. I think Ava and mm-hmm. all the staff at the Neighborhood Services and the agencies are pretty thrilled that you were able to spend time talking about these really tough issues that they deal with every day. Ava, we appreciate, appreciate it. it. All thank right. You. Thank you, everybody, for being here. We'll <laughs> keep on going. All right. Okay. We don't have any other business before us. We are adjourned. It's my <laughs> Okay. Have a nice-
We live in a digital world, so why is riding the bus still so mundane? Well, with the brand new MyStop mobile app, it doesn't have to be. With real-time bus arrival passenger notification technology, you can know exactly when the bus will arrive at your stop. No more waiting around. And when it gets there, mobile ticketing through Token Transit makes boarding quick and painless. The MyStop mobile app and MCAT, helping you on your journey.